going to call the meeting to order. Uh, if you all will rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I do roll call. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Move adoption of the agenda. Would you like, would you like me to take roll? Uh, excuse me, Ms. Goodell, if you would take roll, please. Mr. Ankuma? Aye. Mr. Ms. Skill? Aye. Mr. Lawrence? Here. Mr. Reitender? Here. Ms. Ward? Here. Mr. Webb? Here. Thank you. And just to let um, folks know that uh, Mr. Castillo um, is not feeling well tonight, will not be joining us. And now, if I would ask for uh, adoption of the agenda for this evening? Uh, so moved. A second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Right. And we'll move on to the, the fun part of the evening of the swearing in of the new school board members. So if, if Greg, Shauna, and Shannon would join me uh, for taking the oath of office. Yeah, yeah. And we'll do, we'll do them individually. I'll, Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the Falls Church City School Board. Uh, my name is Paul Ferguson. I'm the clerk of the court for the city of Falls Church and Arlington County, and it's an honor to be with you this evening. I say this all the time, but I sincerely mean it, having uh, spent my career in local government uh, and not having ever served on the school board. Being a member of the school board is the toughest job in local government, so uh, I commend all of you for the job that you're uh, about to take on for the new school board members and for those of you that are serving now on the school board. So Mr. Chairman, I was thinking I would do ladies first, yes. if that's okay. Uh, so we would start in alphabetical order, Shannon would come before Shauna Russell, if that's okay. Ms. Litton, do you have any family members that you want to bring up here with you? <laughs> to assist you? <laughs> okay. Ms. Litton, would you please raise your right hand? Do you, Shannon Litton, solemnly, solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia? and that you will faithfully and partially discharge all the duties incumbent upon you as a member of the City of Falls Church School Board for a term commencing January 1st, 2018 and ending December 31st, 2021, according to the best of your ability. I do. Congratulations. Thank you. You need to sign this form. <laughs> You're good, you're done. And, and next is Shauna Russell. Do you have anybody, Ms. Russell, you want to assist you? Welcome. Ms. Russell, would you please raise your right hand? Do you, Shauna Russell, solemnly swear or affirm that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and that you will faithfully and partially discharge all the duties incumbent upon you as a member of the Falls Church City School Board for a term commencing January 1st, 2018, and ending December 31st, 2021, according to the best of your ability. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, next is Greg Anderson. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Anderson. Great, thank you. Welcome. Would you please raise your right hand? 
Do you, Greg Anderson, solemnly swear or affirm you will uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and you will faithfully and impartially discharge all the duties incumbent upon you as a member of the Falls Church City School Board for a term commencing January 1st, 2018 and ending December 31st, 2021, according to the best of your ability? I do. Congratulations. Chairman Webb. All right, thank you. Of course, you have to be uh, elected chair <laughs> by your colleagues. You are uh, taking an oath um, as a member of the uh, school board uh, to continue on. Yes, sir. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you, Lawrence Webb, solemnly swear or affirm that you will support the uphold and support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia? and you will faithfully and partially discharge all the duties incumbent upon you as a member of the Falls Church City School Board for a term commencing January 1st, 2018 and ending December 31st, 2021, according to the best of your ability. I do. Congratulations once again. I know there's uh, certificates that need to be presented by the electoral board. So I guess you'll have to come back. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Renee Andrews, and I am proud to serve our city as secretary of the electoral board. I'm joined by my colleagues, um, Vice Chair Bill Wanlin and Director of Elections and General Registrar Dave Berkey. Um, just like to read you just a couple of snippets from Code of Virginia Title 24.2, Section 676, that says, the secretary shall make out the certificate for each of the persons who has the highest number of votes for the office, um, who has sufficient votes to be elected, and um, secretary or another board member or registrar designated by the secretary shall deliver in person uh, or by certified mail to the person of elected as soon as the person has complied with the provisions of section 948.2. And you all probably don't know what that means, but you all probably know that that includes the filing that you all did last Thursday that was due last Thursday, so we are delighted that you all have complied in a timely fashion, and we're delighted to present your certificates of election tonight.
Um, before we move on to the next um, agenda item, so I want to make real quick comments of thanks first to uh, friends who have come to, to, to be a part of my swearing in this evening. I do appreciate you all coming. I uh, want to give special recognition to my partner Clifton Taylor, who for another four year term is going to to deal with me in, in some late evenings that come with being a part of this job. I also want to thank Greg Patterson for his help in being the uh, chair for my, um, for my uh, treasurer for my campaign. I do appreciate the, uh, the assistance that you gave. Looking forward to uh, my three new colleagues uh, joining us in January, and I'll hold the other comments for my uh, colleagues who will be leaving the board at the end of the year. Thank you. Uh, so next we're going to move on to the spotlight team FCCPS and Dr. Noonan, if you will. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, good evening uh, and welcome. Um, as you uh, know, we are starting a new tradition um, here in the City of Falls Church where at each school board meeting we'll be doing a spotlight on something in our division that highlights uh, how we work together as a team. Uh, and, and John, Brett, and, and working collaboratively, um, which is a little bit even greater than maybe just as a team. Uh, and John, Brett, along with some other folks, have prepared for us a really nice uh, spotlight on uh, the FCCPS Family Assistance Fund. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. Brett. The Family Assistance Fund was started about 10 years ago when we discovered there was a need for families that it couldn't always be filled by school funds. So things, shoes, coats, hats, school supplies, things of that nature. We do have people who are struggle, struggling with poverty in our own city, yes. There are so many people in, the, in Fairfax County in the City of Falls Church that um, people were not getting adopted in their adopt-a-family um, programs. And so Susan and I decided that we wanted to do it in-house. I think we've at least tripled our number of students. I think the first couple years we were probably in the 20s, the maybe low 30s with the number of students we helped, and we're close to 100 students now. So if they're missing school because they haven't been able to go to the doctor because they don't have insurance, or they haven't gotten their prescription filled, or you know they don't have whatever they need to get to school, we try to help the parents with offsetting those costs. Mary Beth Connolly let us know that the four Ps was going to be having a holiday party and that they collect toys during that time. The four Ps asked her if she knew of somebody who may want those toys and then she came to us and she said, hey, we've got these toys. Do we want to use them in some way? And Susan and I said, yes, we do. <laughs> The number of toys that we get, thank goodness we get enough now still for um, all of the students to usually have three or four toys. They usually have games or basketballs or footballs. So we go to the four Ps to pick up the toys. We get a big van, George helps us to do that. Mary Beth and Colleen and I will be loading the toys into the van. We start to look at the families that we have and we divide those out amongst the kids. The reaction that we get from families, I have to say this is probably like one of my most favorite times of the year. It's a really nice way to connect with our families. They're very and appreciative. They're very appreciative, yeah. they really are. Mr. Chair, we have some members of the team that have put together our uh, Family Assistance Fund, and some of them are here tonight, and publicly I'd like to thank you for, on behalf of the families in the City of Falls Church for your incredible work and what you do. Um, but the board may have some questions, so Mr. Chair, I'd turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, again, I would uh, echo Dr. Noonan and say thank you for the, the very hard and dedicated work that you all do assisting these families here in the city of Falls Church. I want to see if any of my colleagues have any comments or anything. Ms. Gill? So I'm just curious, and this is not a budget question, how is, how is the program funded and how can the community help to continue the program? Um, so <clears throat> all of the donations are um, 
are, I guess, uh, solicited really kind of in a way um, by our community and some of our teachers and staff also contribute to the fund. Um, we also, um, more recently because other community members have heard about it, we have um, some other agencies now that are contributing to us, but mainly it's individuals within our community who have heard about this and contribute to this fund. No, it's great. I, this is actually the first time I've heard about it, um, even though I'm on the school board. So I think it's great and I'd love to get the word out more so that more people can contribute. Yeah. And we're going to start to kind of promote a little bit more within the community, like on some of the listservs, some of the moms groups, things like that. Um, a lot of the businesses that Mary Beth works with, we're going to try to co coordinate more with them as well. So hopefully we'll get the word out even more. So definitely email me, put on false church city parents. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Lawrence? Uh, sort of the flip side of how do you get contributions is how do you identify people? I mean, how do you get the word out? Because, you know, there could be some reluctance about, you know, coming out and asking for help, but people need help whether or not they're, you know, willing at some point to ask for it. So how do you, how do you actively find who needs it? Well, these are families that we know, um, a lot of them because we're the school social workers, and so we tend to know those families. Um, but we also work with our staff and teachers to, as they make relationships with families, students in their classrooms, they get to know them and they let us know if they're hearing about a problem, uh, not a problem, but um, if a need um, within the family, and we, um, that's how we identify them. Okay, but it's it's There's not just people asking. It's it's you no. a actively looking and, and no, offering. We, right, where right. You can. we okay, are good. we are out there um, asking them if they need help. But sometimes they do come to teachers and and they let teachers know that they need help, and then we reach out to them and help them. But but usually they're families that we we already have contact with and we know them. And there definitely is a stigma for some families that are not even willing to even want to participate. I mean, they might certainly qualify, um, I mean, well below the means of poverty level, but we do have those families that are, are appreciative of the help, but just might not accept it either because of mm -hmm. stigma attached. Mr. Reiner. I actually don't have any questions. I just wanted to thank you. It's, it's a wonderful program. Um, I want to thank Mr. Brett as well. It was a great video. Um, I know we're planning on putting it up on the website, but I, I would, I, it's a wonderful, I'd love to do more to help general community awareness, and I'm sure most of my school board, fellow school board members would as well. Um, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity, and it seems to me that there's a lot of, that we could do, we could, we as a school board could do more to continue to drive and enhance the program. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your effort. I really appreciate it. Ms. Ward. I just know as school social workers, you are overwhelmed with your day job, and to take this on, I know is a big, is an extra extra burden, but a burden of love, I can see that. Um, and I understand the confidentiality that's involved with this, but is, is there any way that you could um, use volunteers to help with any part of this program? Uh, we we had thought about that for the, the um, holiday assistance program um, and the way that we do that is you know through the donations people are volunteering um, and um, yeah the hard thing is there the confidentiality is difficult so usually we know the families and the students and so we were actually you know they're picking up the toys and putting them together for a particular student who we know <laughs> and know what they might like. Um, so at this point, yeah. we've sort of done, done it on our own. It is getting bigger, so we might look at that in a different way when we, when, as we need to. Um, but right now, we're, we sort of pick it out for each family and student. It's sort of individualized in that way. Um, but we sh yeah, we should think about that. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think there are a lot of the people that do donate like to donate more tangible items, such as they're always asking us what specifically can they donate. Um, a lot of times it's just easier to donate the gift cards 
Um, but I think it goes back to people wanting to really feel like they are making that specific, you know, difference um, in a family whether they're giving them, you know, a new, a new uh, a bed or something, you know, or piece of furniture, things of that nature. Um, but we can definitely explore more ways to involve the community without, you know, giving names such as helping us to um, even pick up some of the toys and, and just collaborate with other community agencies to try to um, to try to get some of those donations and things like that. But we've, we've definitely worked with Mary Beth mm -hmm. um, to help us with, you know, other kinds of things, not just family, assi the holiday assistance, but like school supplies. And um, we do a coat drive, coat um, hat and gloves drive and things like that. So people are giving to us, um, but sort of the act of giving it to the family, the confidentiality piece is sort of difficult. It's true. Yeah. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you. Anyone else? Is there one yes. Dr. Newman. Yeah, just uh, one last thing, and, and that is, uh, again, thank you so much for your support of our community. Um, but I also want to take a second to thank Liz Germer, um, who's the Director of Special Services, who uh, has promoted and fostered a sense of um, creativity and thoughtfulness and given these fine folks an opportunity to do that as part of their work. So um, thanks to Liz for, for that support as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to move on to recognition of school board members um, to my three colleagues who um, are finishing up their service on the board. Uh, first, we'll be uh, I'll speak a little bit about Michael and Kuma. Uh, Michael has served on the board from January 1st, 2014 to present. In his leadership capacity, he has been a strong advocate for strong schools and for strong community engagement in our schools. He has served on many committees that have helped FCCPS continue to be the beacon of excellence. Excuse me. Uh, he serves, his service includes Chamber of Commerce, Economic Working Group that has been tasked with the development of the 10 acres of the GM site. He also has been on the elementary PTA and Ban Boosters Advisory Committees. Uh, Michael has been a great friend to me uh, serving on the board and prior to the service of the board. Uh, Michael is the guy who I know I can pick up the phone call if I have a something I'm working in my head and trying to figure out if it's gonna flow well. Michael's the guy who I can pick up the phone and call and ask those questions to and Michael can be uh, quite frank when he uh, gives you those responses so you always know where if it's gonna be something that's gonna go smooth or something that may need a little bit more tweaking and working with and I've definitely appreciated that with Michael over the last four years um, being on the board. Uh, thank you for your dedication and service to the board, Michael. And at the, at the end of this, um, each individual, I'm going to read what's on the uh, certificate that we're going to be presenting as well. Uh, next is Margaret Ward. Uh, Margaret has been on the board as well since January 1st, 2014 to present. Margaret has been a star board member that brings a unique and important voice to the board. Ms. Ward is a teacher first and then a school board member. As such, she has always taken the, the posture of ensuring equality for all and excellence. She looks out for every single, every single student regardless of background. Margaret has served in many other roles in FCCPS to include the advisory committees for daycare, athletic boosters, and gifted and talented. Uh, Margaret, again, has been a great colleague uh, as being an advocate for some areas that some of us on the board who may not necessarily think about, but Margaret is definitely going to be that member who brings up that, that perspective, particularly being a parent of high school student when we were talking about parking, for an example, uh, Margaret made sure that students' perspective of that, of losing some of the potential parking, um, is, was brought up as part of the conversation that we had. Margaret also is very um, important part of us to making sure that we stay on time and on track at our board meetings because we know Margaret has to kind of like the uh, the egg will kind of go away if after a certain hour of time. So Margaret has kept us on task and I think working with Margaret this year as being the board chair 
uh, has definitely kept me on task to make sure that we're out of here on evenings at a reasonable hour. Um, again, Margaret, thank you very much for your, your service to the board. And finally, uh, John Lawrence. John has served on the board from October 1st, 2012 to present and as vice chair from July 2013 to December 2014 and again from January 2015 to uh, December 2016. John has served with dignity and has always been a person who keeps us on our toes when it comes to procedures and policies. His eagle eye has ensured that our work as board serve, our work as board serves everyone well. As a former chair, vice chair, John has been instrumental in moving many ideas and issues of the board forward and has always sought to find resolution that meets the needs of all. Most importantly, the students we serve. John has served in a variety of roles in FCCPS as a board member to include liaison to the Education Foundation the Mount Daniel ASAC and George Mason PTSA advisory committees. Uh, John, definitely uh, that line in the beginning of it uh, keeps us on task uh, of me taking on this year of being board chair. John has definitely been a person who has been um, a great assistance to me, getting um, my, uh, my bearings of the Roberts rules. Uh, so it has definitely been a help to me. Uh, John, seeing uh, John in many other capacities, working very hard with the Mount Daniel project um, from its inception to now we're seeing the project moving forward. And he has been a very um, strong advocate of that particular project. Uh, John, again, I want to thank you for, uh, for your service to the board and the serving with you over the last four years. For the certificate, I'm going to read what's on the certificate. Um, BIE Partnership Brick Pathway. A commemorative brick has been purchased for you and it will be installed in the BIE Brick Pathway at George Mason High School. The following text will be engraved on each brick, and I'll just for each person who will have the same thing. Uh, for Michael, Michael and Kuma School Board member, FCCPS uh, 2014 to 17, Margaret Ward. School board member, FCCPS, 2014 to 17. And John Lawrence, school board, FCCPS, 2012 to 2017. The brick will be a permanent pla permanently placed at the auditorium entrance of George Mason High School as a lasting tribute to your connection with Falls Church City Public Schools. And as you all know, with, uh, as we're moving forward with the brand new uh, George Mason, you will be a brick that will be in um, our brand new pathway to the new auditorium of the new high school. So if each of you stand, we'll do a picture real quick and I'll present you with your certificates. And next we'll move on to a special education update, uh, Dr. Noonan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd like to invite up um, Liz Germer from our Office of Special Services. Uh, as you'll recall, several months ago we did receive um, a, a, an audit report um, regarding our special services here in the City of Falls Church. 
Uh, and when we uh, talked about those at a work session to follow, we discussed um, some of the potential uh, next steps with respect to that. And I've asked uh, Ms. Germer to tonight brief us on um, where we are with some of those next steps that we talked about. So I know that she's uh, prepared, although the technology, um, John, maybe could help us, um, is not exactly up. So uh, I think we're on it here just in a second. Can you help us with the? <laughs> that should work. We're making the technology assistive technology here for the benefit of the special education report. We need to update you. Thank you, John. All right, Ms. Grammer. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to give you an update on where we are and where we're heading in terms of special education. So as Dr. Noonan mentioned, I think you all recall that last spring we had a special education study um, and the result of that uh, study, which included a variety of things such as surveys, observations, focus groups, review of records, resulted in a report that is still on our website with 54 recommendations. So since that study has been completed, we've taken the time to review the rec recommendations and kind of analyze our current state. There were some things in the recommendations that were already in place or in motion. Um, we needed to identify what are we already working on? What are the recommendations that we feel are priority ones for the first year? Uh, what about the next two and three years heading out? And then come up with an action plan because we know we can't implement 54 things in one year. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that those items that we identified to work on aligned with our new triennial work plan and our strategic plan. So we want to make sure that what we're doing meshes with the goals and priorities of the division. As you look at all the recommendations that were made, I, I can kind of lump them into sort of four different sort of buckets. Um, there were a number related to professional development, and those were professional development as it pertains to teachers, as it pertains to principals, related service providers. There were instructional support recommendations, supporting our teachers, supporting our students. Um, there were procedures and practices kinds of recommendations, looking at consistency with implementation, guidance documents, and so forth. And then there were recommendations that really fell under the category of community engagement. So in thinking of our action plan moving forward, I kind of clustered our actions in each of these major themes. So what are we doing this year? In terms of, profet I don't know why it's funny like that on the screen, John, but anyway. Um, for professional development, um, one of the areas that was referenced was um, the need for some additional training and support for our administrators. We have had um, a number of new administrators join our team. Um, some of them may have more or less experience and knowledge with regard to special education. So one of the actions that we're taking this year is um, uh, we've purchased four courses on four key topics. Um, and as kind of a leadership team group, we are taking those courses together, one per quarter, and then having some conversations and review and reflection on those topics. Topics such as discipline, um, harassment, um, autism, there's you know, different key topics that, that we feel are really important to make sure everyone has that basic tier one understanding of. So that's happening right now. 
We've already begun to focus on special populations, so both for secondary and for elementary. We recently had a professional development afternoon. Teachers could self-select. I was very excited that the middle and the high school principals self-identified that mental health and autism were two key topics that their staff really needed some support in and were asking for. So I think one of the things that's really positive is there's a sort of a sense of urgency around some of these key topics that blend very nicely with the recommendations and the work we're trying to do moving forward. So that special population session has happened. We got really good feedback from the teachers and we're developing plans for moving forward, how to follow up on that and how to let grade level teams or department teams identify what areas they need to know more about. We're also focusing on job, in, job embedded professional development and support. So for instance, looking at uh, the sixth grade team may feel that they need support in a particular area around a group of students. So a little bit more student specific than the big sort of special populations workshop. So we have worked out plans for, for instance, our behavior specialist is meeting with the sixth grade team and working with them during their planning time. So looking for those opportunities to embed that support around specific student needs um, is one of the things that we're really focused on this year, especially at the secondary level, especially at the middle school right now is kind of our focus. In terms of instructional support, there's already, as you know, a lot of instructional support that's provided to our teachers. One of the recommendations, or a few of them, had to do with the collaboration between special education and general education. <laughs> you should have just let me use your computer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have no idea what it's like. I don't know. Um, and, and that was probably something we really did need to enhance. Um, I think we worked well together, but in terms of having sort of structures and frameworks that fostered those professional conversations to be sure that we were all on the same, on the same page were happening a little bit more ad hoc. So right now um, I'm meeting weekly with um, Lisa High and Summer Manos and Jeannie Seabridge to make sure we're all kind of on the same page with what we're doing. Um, Summer Manos is coming to some of our leadership team uh, meetings so that we're infusing RTI with special education topics. They're also participating in the, prof in the professional development uh, activities and courses that we're doing. So we're having more professional conversations across special and general education, which I think I feel really good about. Another area of recommendations had to do with walkthroughs and rubrics and you know, how do principals know what to look for in certain types of classrooms or with certain specialty types of teachers. And um, one of the things I did right at the beginning of the year was share two different rubrics with all the administrators. It's not to take the place of the rubric that's used for our performance evaluation, but it does show, well, what does that particular item on the rubric what does that mean for a special education teacher who might be teaching a modified curriculum? What does it look like? What are some key look-fors that are unique to, to teaching a child with a disability? Um, partly to give the opportunity for those teachers to be able to highlight the good work that they do. I did share the rubrics with the teachers as well and encourage them to think about those as they develop their own professional goals so that they could focus goals on the kind of work they do and also to identify areas within the rubric where they feel they might like some more support that we could provide. So there were two different types of rubrics that they received. One is more for special education teachers working kind of in a variety of settings and one was really geared towards some of our teachers who are working with students who are not on the, the working towards a, a standard diploma because I think those classes and sometimes students with intellectual disabilities, it's difficult for a principal depending on their background to know what does it look like, what do you expect to see in those classes? So those have been created and shared. School-based supports have been in place. This isn't anything new, but with your support last year, we were able to add little pieces of people to increase our behavior specialist support so that now we have um, a full-time behavior specialist supporting Mount Daniel 
and Jesse Thackeray. We have one full-time supporting middle and high school, and then one and a half still at TJ. The good thing about those positions is they are system-wide, so as the needs shift, we might need to shift a little bit if we find a heavier concentration in one school versus the other. But the feedback around the support from these individuals is very positive. Um, our CTLs also are, are instructional leaders in our buildings, and we have those for special education, and then we have our team leaders as well. So we have some in-school specialists and instructional support leaders that are working with our teams. What we're focusing on, though, is sometimes our teacher leaders, not everyone's an expert in every area of special education. And depending on the needs of the students, those folks, I count on them to reach out when they feel they need more, you know, and what do they need so that we can come up with a plan. And our school psychologists, you may not know this, they're really critical members of our multi-tiered systems of support model. One of the things we know that's really important is that we are implementing preventative proactive plans for students um, so that we can mitigate any potential, you know, uh, mental health issues or other kinds of social, emotional, or behavioral needs that may come up. I will share with you that the area we're seeing a, an increase is, is mental health and social, emotional, and behavioral needs and autism, um, particularly at the secondary level. And the psychologists really play a critical role. So I just kudos to them. Sometime I'd love to see them be a spotlight um, on some of the work that they do um, because they really play a critical role. So we've been able to push them into that team process a little bit more. In terms of procedures and practices, I mean, one of the recommendations was to update the case manager manual. That was, you know, kind of easy to do, but that's been updated. Um, it is electronic. It was shared with everyone as policies or, or additional guidance documents are developed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those will be added to that to that manual. We did give paper copies of the manual to every new teacher and kind of highlighted sort of the key sections. Um, some you know policies have been updated. I know Trish keeps you up to date on that. I'm really excited about yellow folder. So that's my highlight on this page. Um, in terms of the board's uh, request to look for operational efficiency, and that's within our triennial work plan, we're piloting yellow folder, which is an electronic filing system. We're focusing solely on our special education records at this point, and our goal is to see if we can move to a paperless system. Um, and you probably don't know, but right now if we have a student who's being referred for special education evaluated, reports are flying back and forth through George and, and through the email to our office and copied and then the bag sent to the school with the file and there's a lot of people, manpower, paper involved. Um, I think it's a process that would benefit from some increased efficiencies um, and I think it will actually enhance our communication around our students and their needs. So we're piloting it this year. We're actually doing our final training tomorrow and we'll begin rolling it out. Um, and see how it goes, and if we think it's a good system, we'll implement it fully next year. Um, I meet with the special education administrative representatives from each school twice a month, once we meet collectively, and that really is our opportunity to make sure we're all on the same page, what are the burning issues. I usually share information from the state level with them, um, and then I meet individually with each of them to help support them with their schools. And we do have a rubric. One of the recommendations had to do with the use of a rubric to assess the quality of our IEPs. At this point, we're using it at the school with the special ed administrators. Kind of do a poll, review, see what the trends are, what are the needs. You'll see in year two, we need to focus on training principals on the rubric before we start asking them to look at the IEPs as well. Community engagement, I do have a monthly special education newsletter. If you haven't signed up, you can sign up online. It's on the website. Um, and this year I've been trying to push things out to the schools for the schools to include in their newsletter. So for instance, TJ I think has a special education corner. Um, usually if there's an item, I'll push it out to the other schools. I don't know if they have a special ed corner or not. Um, so we're trying to get the information into multiple sources and we know that the families in the community really read the principal's newsletters. 
Um, we're going to do, at the elementary level, two elementary principal coffees that focus on special education, so Mount Daniel and TJ. Um, and that's just an opportunity, even with uh, Mr. Swanson's chalk chats, to say, hey, we're, you know, we're here to answer questions about special education. So it's not a presentation, but again, it's an opportunity to make that connection with the community. I think it's important when looking at community engagement around special ed is to try to infuse those things into existing structures. We know that people don't turn out for lots of events, so we want to take advantage of those things that already have an audience built in. We will be doing two parent universities for special education, one on the child find process and one for uh, parents of students with disabilities in the transition to college. Um, and we are promoting the special education advisory committee meetings through the school newsletters. Year two is a little shorter explanation. Uh, this is the plan, subject to change, of course, but in terms of professional development, we really are working on a professional development plan. What does that look like? What are the needs? What are the priorities? And I think we need to get into the nitty gritty of like when and how and who, and what does it look like? You know, that's, we kind of know the needs and we're tackling that, but I think the next year, really, we need to get down to when and how and who. Um, and we need to focus on, uh, professional development with the principals around IEPs so that they are able to look at those and include that as part of their evaluation process for special education. And as they sit in more IEP meetings, they have better information to know what to look for. We'll continue with yellow folder. I'm already determining that we're going to like it. Um, and we're going to focus on developing decision-making guides and tools for teachers. So those frequently asked questions, there's some place to go and look and see, and you don't have to ask somebody or call me. Um, instructional support, really need to focus on data collection and progress monitoring. That's the next piece. How are we monitoring progress? We focused a lot on SMART goals and the development of SMART goals, but we need to do more in the area of progress monitoring. Um, I think we need to revisit and refocus on co-teaching, and particularly at middle and high school. We're actually doing much more co-teaching now at elementary. I'm really excited about that, especially at TJ. Um, we've really got some great models in place. Those teachers are, they're truly modeling effective co-teaching practices, and that's really exciting. We've never had that before. Um, and then autism and behavioral supports is going to be an ongoing need. Related services, I am meeting quarterly with the related service providers. That was another recommendation we're meeting next week and really looking at their needs. I think that they sometimes are also a forgotten group um, because they have unique needs in terms of their own professional development, um, their own resources, their own assessments and things like that. So I think they appreciate the opportunity to be heard. And community engagement, uh, we have already started to do this a little bit. We've, we're doing our meetings at uh, each of the schools and at each of the schools this year. Uh, the, some folks are presenting, highlighting some of the practices and sort of initiatives and focus that they have in their particular buildings. But I think the committee is really committed to doing more parent workshops. We've had the uh, representative from the ARC come to the last meeting and the committee has chosen a topic the ARC has a grant and they're gonna be doing something on executive functioning. So there's a lot more uh, community and parent outreach with that committee. Um, and then each school will have one parent coffee. So this year we're gonna have two parent coffees or two meetings at schools. Next year we'd like to have one at each building. We do have a parent coffee every month at Jesse Thackeray. So that's already happening. And finally, year three, uh, the Schoology course, I actually have already started this. I've already got, um, I've got the case manager things in there. I've got uh, other resources and documents. I just haven't made it live to anybody. Uh, but that would be sort of your go-to place where all the information would be kind of housed, which is easier than going to Google Docs and finding everything. Um, so I think that could be a really helpful tool. Um, instructional support, really, again, I can't emphasize enough the focus on mental health. Um, and then uh, continuing to get our guidance documents on our website. We need to always be updating. Right now we need to update. We have outdated forms on the, on the website, so trying to keep up with that. And thanks to John Brett for always helping when I'm like, ah, can we put this on the website? Um, <laughs> huh? 
Yeah, well, that's okay. Um, and then the parent resource materials, really trying to look at how can we partner with the library, how can we get materials out there for parents in the community, like what makes sense for that? We know we don't have the ability to have a parent resource center. I'm not even sure that that would be the best way to do it, um, but w do we have parent liaisons? You know, what, what can we do to increase that homeschool connection around supporting our students and our parents who have children with disabilities? So looking ahead, you all will have budget requests, of course. Um, and again, the disability trends. I think that's really, really important. You know, often we'll look at a number. We have X percent of students with disabilities, or we have this many students at this school or that school. But it's really important to understand the complexity of the needs. Each student is, is unique, and not all students have the same needs. So it really is really based on any requests that I ever make is really based on needs of students and what do our teachers need in order to meet those needs. That's all I have. Any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Garmer. Uh, are there any questions from, from board members? Okay. Um, Ms. Ward. I would like to say I, I love what I've seen um, in this presentation, and I'm particularly impressed with the courses that you're providing for the principals and the general education teachers. Um, special education is such, um, it's its own unique type of educating students, and a lot of, a lot of general educators don't necessarily understand it. Some do, um, but they don't because it's not part of their program when they're studying. So um, I think that will go far um, towards helping support our, our kids with special needs, and um, I'm really happy to see that. Thank you. Mr. Lawrence. The, the yellow folder you mentioned, how digital can you go? Because, you know, I, I get the feeling that when it comes to, to special ed, the process sometimes takes over, and there are a lot of forms, there's a lot of papers, there are a lot of meetings. Can you go completely digital with something like this? I mean, it would, it would be wonderful. I'm just fearing that the process is against you. you. You actually can. That being said, I'm sure there'll be times where we have to print something, scan, and upload it. Um, the way the system works, we've um, submitted records that have been scanned to teach them how to recognize our documents in terms of putting them in folders. So each student will have uh, the folders and the system's been trained to recognize so that when we do an IEP, when we select print and you go down, you have yellow folder and it goes into yellow folder. We are in the process of updating our forms to make them all, make sure everything's fillable and it does take an electronic signature. If we have a parent who really wants to you know, sign, we can sign and upload you know, that one page and just move it into the folder. So all of our forms are already electronic and probably 95% of them are fillable. Um, we're, we're fixing the last few that we have that don't have that capability. So then really it can all be done in that system. We still have to have a uh, paper, cop like paper copy or two at the actual meeting, that's kind of, we have to have that. Um, but we won't have to be making, you know, five and six copies. The other thing I like about it is right now, um, the way our system works is parents get a letter and we have to provide a copy of the evaluation so many days prior to the meeting. And the letter says, come to central office and pick it up because we are collecting, we are copying, we are collating, we are making the files. And you know that's just not convenient, super convenient for families. With this system, you actually can email the, all the reports in advance in an encrypted email so that they are getting it. If they don't have email, obviously we would provide it another way. But that will increase, I think, the likelihood of parents reading it or at least you know having it in advance because not everyone can come and pick it up on a Thursday afternoon. Um, and so they will get it. We will have a record that it was sent. We can see you know, if they've opened it. Same with our general education teachers. We can share the IEPs through the program to all the general ed teachers who serve that child rather than what we're doing now, which is print, scan, upload, Google Drive, share, permissions, you know, every, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of, of 
paperwork. So this will make it, I think, more manageable. I'm sure there'll be bumps along the way. That's why we're trying it out. Um, I don't think the cost is prohibitive at all compared to just what we pay in terms of paper, George, bags. Um, and I think if it works, we could look at, they do all records. It's not just special education, but for me, it would be special ed and maybe 504 if we like it. Okay, thank you. And you answered my, my second question, which is not just is it making it easier for you, but is it making it easier for the parents? Mm -hmm. Good. I think so. Thank you. I think so. Because I think you can send them, hey, I, we often get, I, I can't find my copy of whatever, let's say, a evaluation or something like that. We can just email it out to them. And if they want a paper copy, of course, we'll provide it. Um, but if they want to have access to all those records, we can email those records. We don't have to print them. Any other comments? Mr. Reininger. Just briefly, um, thank you, Ms. Germer. I, I wanted to compliment you and your staff's approach to the special education audit, which is not about, oh, we did some things wrong. It's, we've got a report, how can we do things even better? And that's exactly, I think, the way to do it. And it, I applaud what you and, and the school system have done in response to the special education report. The other thing um, I'll, I can be very brief on, Mr. Uh, Lawrence uh, presaged what I was going to say. You know, I think moving to electronic records will have huge benefits for you. As you say, it can be a fairly difficult transition, but once it's accomplished, it can just be, especially if it can spread throughout the school system, it can add so many more efficiencies. And I'm thinking back to the budget debates we had, not this year, but last year, where we talked about the over, you know, overextension on copiers and how teachers were having to line up and we needed more copiers in the schools. If we can get away from that, I think everybody's going to be a lot happier. So again, thank you. It sounds like you're approaching it exactly right. Anyone else? I just, oh, go ahead, Ms. Ward. Yeah, I, I just want, want to echo uh, what Mr. Reitinger said about um, the yellow folders. I, I couldn't imagine working with paper copies of IEPs and all the other supporting documents. So kudos to you for getting that started and moving that along. Thank you. And just finally, um, for my comments, um, I definitely appreciate mm -hmm. the, and seeing the work that has gone into this. Uh, many times when we see these type of things, audits and other reports coming back, kind of letting us know what we're doing, you kind of take it as a something that's kind of in a negative way, pointing out things that, you, that you're not doing right. but. What I appreciate what you and your staff have done is actually take it as a way to move forward to implement and do even a much better job for our students and the, uh, the special education population. And uh, we look forward to continuing seeing the implementation of where you've already gotten the, the ball rolling in that. Thank you. Uh, I, I won't uh, repeat everything that everybody else has said. I just want to thank Liz publicly again for her incredible work. Um, I think it's easy to take these reports and feel defeated, um, but we felt empowered when we got it because there were so many things in it that we felt like, one, we could work with very easily, uh, and two, some things that were in place, and three, some places that we could get better. And uh, I think that, that Liz did absolutely take the right approach to this and has done an outstanding job for us. So thank you. Thank you. And next, we're going to move on to public comment. In accordance with school board bylaws 2.30, the time for each speaker is limited to three minutes. Initial written statement may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to the board, to, to the board members, uh, and for the record, deposition of the request. Uh, we have one request tonight, and that is from Amy er Erhart. And I apologize if I said your, your last name incorrectly. Yes, good evening. My name is Amy Urquhart, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, dear Chairman, Vice Chairman, Dr. Noonan, and the school board, um, it's my honor to be speaking before you tonight. I notice on the agenda that there will be a discussion of courses available at George Mason next year. And it would be really appreciated if American Sign Language would be considered as a possible option when they're looking at coursework for students who have difficulty with language processing, such as dyslexia or other language-based disabilities or difficulties. 
American Sign Language would be an ideal option as a world language. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other comments? If not, we will uh, move on to the closed meeting. Uh, if someone will read us into close, please. Sure. Um, Mr. Chair, pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose, to discuss or consider the identified subject matter. Personnel under Section 2.2-377A1, in particular, staff appointments, staff reassignments, staff resignations, staff retirement, staff performance, staff change in position, child care leave, long-term medical leave, leave of absence, and advisory committee appointments and resignations, and public safety under Section 2.2-377A19. In particular, discussion of reports or plans related to the security of any governmental facility, building, or structure, or the safety of persons using such facility, building, or structure. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, and also a question. Are we gonna have our um, members elect join us? I believe so, we'll have them come back. Okay. Do we need to amend the motion to specifically say we're including them? I don't believe so, no. Okay. Right. Ms. Goodell, yes. if you uh, would call the roll. Aye. Uh, Ms. Gill? Aye. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. Ms. Ward? Yes. Mr. Webb? Yes. Thank you. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Do it. Right. And if someone would uh, certify the meeting. Sure. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, whereas the Falls Church City School Board has convened a closed meeting on this day pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-377B of the Code of Virginia requires the certification by the school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church City Public School Board hereby certifies to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lawrence. Uh, Ms. Goodell? Aye. Aye. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. Ms. Ward? And Mr. Webb. Yes. Thank you. All right. And before we move the uh, consent agenda, I am going to remove one item, which is already under uh, business actions and information of the appointment of the chief operating officer. So with that, I move unanimous consent to approve the consent agenda. All right. So we're. All right. And the next item on the. Agenda is the appointment of the Chief Operating Officer, Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, members of the community that are present. It is my distinct honor and pleasure um, to announce the appointment tonight of Ms. Kristen Michael as the Chief Operating Officer here in the City of Falls Church. Um, I have had the um, honor and privilege of working with Ms. Michael um, in my former life uh, before I came to Falls Church um, over the last decade or so and have known her in a variety of different positions, most recently, however, as the Director of Budget for Fairfax County Public Schools, and most recently as the Asu Assistant Superintendent for Finance in Fairfax County Public Schools. Uh, in each of the positions that she's held, um, she has always shown excellent leadership, excellent judgment, um, has been always the sharpest, um, I was gonna say the sharpest knife in the drawer, but that may, that may be a little bit loose uh, for the conversation tonight, but certainly the brightest bulb everywhere I've gone. Um, I, I will share very quickly a brief story that I, um, uh, with, with the community, and that is, um, many of you know, I live in the town of Clifton, and I live not too far from someone who's a professor at George Mason University who teaches in their um, Masters of Public Administration department. And she came running over to me at an event one time and she said, oh my goodness, do you know Kristen Michael? And I said, of course I know Kristen Michael. Everybody knows Kristen Michael. And she said, she by far is the best student I've ever had in my entire career teaching. Um, and that's attribution to Melissa Milne, um, by the way. And, and it just was a moment for me to realize not only is she a learner, not only is she, um, uh, is she personable, um, but she's got all the right tools to really help us, I think, in our operations here in, in the city. Um, so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, if it 
pleases the board. I'd, I'd love to invite Ms. Michael up for an opportunity to speak, but one last thing before I do. Um, this evening before we brought her over uh, to, to meet you all, she had a chance to meet the administrative team. And when I got there, I was sitting in front of the video cameras at the central office waiting for somebody to come to the door and I heard laughing in the background and it was Kristen and Lisa and they're already hitting it off. So we've got a really great team that's building right off the bat and, and what a wonderful addition she will be to our team. Thank you, Dr. Janet. Uh, Ms. Michael, if you would. Thank you to the chair, the school board, and Dr. Noonan. I'm truly honored to be joining Falls Church City Public Schools as your chief operating officer. I value the trust that you're placing in me, and I commit to always put the students and the employees and your community in all of my daily activities, and it will put them in the forefront of my thoughts as I work to build a collaborative, um, engaging attempt um, to continue to improve the work that, that happens here every day. Um, I know this is just a fabulous team of people, um, and I am thrilled to be joining them. Um, throughout my career, I've felt truly blessed to work with really great and inspirational people, people I've worked for, people that have worked for me, and I really will bring that spirit of optimism and collaboration um, as I work to serve your students. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, I will entertain a motion, please. Uh, Mr. Reininger. Mr. Chairman, I move that the school board approve the appointment of Chief Operating Officer Kristen Michael, effective January 16th, 2018. Second. Thank you, Mr. Ankuma. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations. Thank we you. We look forward to having you. Looking forward to working with you here in, uh, on January 16th. Next item is the approval of new GME, GMHS course offering. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to welcome um, uh, Mr. Hills, Mr. Matt Hills, principal at uh, George Mason, and Alana Reyes, uh, director of school counseling for the city of Falls Church, um, this evening, who are going to share with you their proposals for some new courses at the high school. Um, I will say, in my experience, typically this is a, uh, a consent sort of agenda item. Um, typically, uh, the proposals would come to Lisa High and, and to myself for approval, and we would put them on for consent. Um, but since this is our first go around together, um, I thought it would be important for them to be able to talk about what they're offering uh, and their plans for George Mason for the 18-19 school year. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Hills and Ms. Reyes. Thank you, Dr. Noonan, and thank you to the board members for giving us an opportunity to speak tonight about some of our new and revised course offerings. Uh, first, I'd like to start off by once again co congratulating our newest board members. We're very excited to work with you uh, as we continue to make a commitment to excellence throughout uh, the entire Falls Church City Public School District, so thank you. So tonight we'd like to propose several new high school courses. Um, as well as propose new courses, we want to talk about uh, certain realignments within our mathematics structure. Uh, we would also like to propose um, switching certain courses around to adhere to many of our division goals and priorities, including to become um, and continue to be the IB premier school district in the nation. Uh, before I give Director Reyes an opportunity to describe the potential course offerings, I wanted to talk a little bit about the process that we used. Um, at GM, we believe very strongly in, in a collaborative approach, and so we wanted to make sure that we included our teacher leaders as well as our collaborative team leaders. Um, in doing so, we felt it was very important uh, for us to uh, bring back what we used to have years ago, something called curriculum council. Uh, even though we have uh, incredible teachers that understand what is needed for their particular disciplines, we also thought it was important to include them in the conversation in terms of uh, new offerings for other disciplines as well. And what we did was we actually had two meetings. Uh, we asked the team to consider 
how some of these new course offerings would ultimately impact some of our students. And we always have to recognize that this is a numbers game. Uh, we are driven by numbers. We are driven by student requests and ultimately recognizing because we are a small school district, at times we, we run into situations where we may not be able to run a course that several of our students want. Um, that was definitely a contributing factor in determining which courses we would like to propose. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Alana Reyes, our Director of Counseling, to talk a little bit about the new proposals as well as the revised, uh, the revised courses. Good evening. Thank you guys for having us. Um, so I'll begin. I believe we submitted our four proposals. We had several proposals from our staff this year. We opened it up and allowed them to really come forward with their ideas. And through our curriculum council, we were able to narrow it down, again, with our principals kind of oversee, uh, allowing Ms. Ms. High and um, Mr. Hills to oversee the process and really thinking about how each new class could potentially impact our whole schedule and the budget and everything, but also not predicting what kids might sign up for and might not. And we feel like we have four classes that are really meeting the needs of all of our kids. Um, and so I'll just go through one by one. Um, the first one is Honors Algebra II Geometry. And this is definitely something new. Um, I'm sure no one experienced this when they were in high school. We have a new IB curriculum coming down the pike in the next few years. Right now, what we currently have is a math studies class, an SL math, and an HL math. And that is going by the wayside in its current form. There'll be a new form that is offered, but we wanna be able to allow all of our students to access the highest level of math that they would like to access. And in our current system, it's kinda like, depending on when you start algebra, is it sixth grade, well, seventh grade, eighth grade, determines where you'll be able to end up in your IB curriculum. And if you don't start early enough, you're limited in how far you can go. And so we really feel like with our new course offerings for IB that we have to move to for, you know, as an IB school, this Honors Algebra II Geometry course is the way to go. Um, we, the math department is the one that came up with this proposal. It will be with the new IB requirements, we're really preparing our ninth grade to be able to take those new exams in the next few years. And so we'll kind of have two tracks our current, our current classes that are there, and then the new ninth graders and their needs in meeting those IB goals. Um, it also will level the playing field. Obviously, some of our students are academically mature enough to handle algebra in seventh grade, and they're successful, and they go on to geometry in eighth grade, but many are not. And so we feel by offering this Honors Algebra II Geometry in ninth grade, the students that are taking Honors Algebra II and the students that they take this new class will both be able to matriculate into pre-calculus in 10th grade, and then have the opportunity to either take HL math or SL math in their junior and senior year. So, you know, thinking about our division goals one and three, it really meets both of those needs. Should I keep going or do you want to ask questions on that one? <laughs> keep going, okay. Um, the next one is Honors Algebra II in the same vein, thinking about leveling the playing field. Because we are hoping to offer this new Honors Geometry Algebra II combo, we would like to take trigonometry out of the Algebra II curriculum. And you might think, oh, we can just do that, but we felt like it was important to be transparent because our community is invested in what their students are taking, and especially with trigonometry, a lot of parents feel that that's an important thing to have on the transcript. It will be covered in pre-calculus. It is a Honors Pre-Calculus Trigonometry course, and we feel like that really meets the needs of our students. So that is really the only only, again, it's leveling the playing field for all of our kids to be able to access IB, whether it's HL or SL. Um, the next course is IB Global Politics. We currently offer a class called International Relations, and it's, I'd say, one of our most popular classes. Our current teacher has really grown the program over the last two years. Um, it's kind of one of those hot items that a lot of kids want to take. And what we have found is she has built the curriculum around for international relations around the IBSL global politics curriculum. There's a lot of commonality, commonalities that she uses in both. And so she wanted to offer this IB global politics. It would be a one year SL class and we would like to offer that class in a replacement for international relations. What we've also found for international relations is a lot of our students that might not access higher level classes are taking that class and are being successful and we feel like we could access that same population of kids that might be reticent to take some IB level courses but they could be successful in the IB global politics class. 
And the final one is the IB Design SL. It's a one-year course. Right now, we currently don't have any, we don't offer any courses in our design tech sequence that meet the, that go to the IB level. So we have lots of classes like robotics and engineering and architectural drawing that really meet that basic need. But if we have so many students in that capacity that want to continue to learn in that field, but we don't offer it at the IB level. And we really feel like this is the next step in growing that program. We're also aligning our current programs in our design and tech field to really make it a more structured, tiered approach. You kind of go through a design one, design two, and then moving, moving into IB design. Um, so we're hoping to build that program and kind of grow the capacity of our makerspace and our robotics. Any questions? Questions, anyone? Mr. Lawrence? Uh, just a quick question on the, uh, the IB design technology one. That's the only course that's not replacing something else. Correct. So you've got a faculty member who in their, their time, their caseload, their student load has enough bandwidth to be able to do this at least at the start because, I mean, let's face it, at the start, if something is popular, suddenly it explodes and the next year you've got a whole different problem. We really feel, and, and that's a very good point, we're interested to see where this population comes from. We can directly correlate where everywhere the other classes are going to fill from. Um, this one is a little bit different. We see that we do have the teacher capacity to accommodate this need. Um, we are aligning, right now we offer a three sequence of basic technical drawing, architectural drawing, and engineering drawing. We're, like I said, compacting that into a two course sequence and then going into here. I do think, you know, we have those kids that may go by the, that go by the wayside in this capacity, in this field, because we don't offer that next level. Um, I think some of them might fu funnel into um, IB film. Sometimes it's a good fit, sometimes it's not. Maybe IB computer science. They might not be computer science kids, but they feel like they want to stay in that CTE-ish designing technical field, and that's where they go, but their heart isn't in computer science. And so they kind of take their SL year, and they're like, I'm done. Um, so we do feel like there is the capacity to accommodate that with our current teachers. That's a long answer. Other questions? Mr. Ankoma? Uh, and do all these have to be, are they already blessed by the IB program or do you have, do you create them and then submit them for approval? It's blessed. I mean, oh, if this, okay. is, this is, these are IB to prog program briefs. They've been created through IBO. We are just accepting them into our curriculum. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Ward. So I just want to clarify the IB design technology SL, that's it's brand new, it's, it's, um, it's, it'll be a brand new course and it's, it'll help us fulfill ultimately our IB goals, yes, in all areas, not just, I see a lot, there's always a lot of stress on, you know, like the, the, um, the academics, like the math and the history and all that, and it's nice to see this IB class in design. And I, and I will tell you, for that. it's a group four class and that's the sciences. And so you, if you have a student that really loves this, but they might, be not, they might not be chem IB bound or IB bio bound, they would still have to fulfill the Virginia requirements for graduation, but they could take this and it would fulfill their, their I, they potentially could earn an IB diploma where it might have been impossible before. So it's exciting. I, I think also when you think about in terms of matriculating through a four-year program, uh, especially in terms of some of our CT offerings, this really does allow us to streamline that particular process, and that was uh, part of the reason why we wanted to bring this back. Uh, this is a course that, that we did have uh, probably about maybe six years ago, um, and taking a look at some of the student requests and what they're looking uh, to, to earn a diploma in moving forward, this is something we definitely wanted to add to our program of studies. Mr. Holmes. Uh, for the math courses uh, in the school, um, are there going to be uh, non-IC pre-calc classes offered? Um, I'm just asking because uh, many students, if they do math SL, math studies or math SL mm -hmm. junior year and they want to switch out of the IB program, um, the only option they really have now is AP stats if they want a classroom that's non-IC and that's not doing so well. I know that because I take the class and also I know other students in it. Um, so are there other options offered for seniors who've already taken math studies SL and don't want to continue on with the IB path? That's a really good question. So actually math studies will no longer be offered. 
um, that one year SL class will go away. What it's being replaced with is something called IB approach, um, wrong. It's called IA. So it's IB approaches, and there's another term which I am currently missing, but it's basically like a social science approach to math. Um, at least that's how it's being touted. IB hasn't put out their formal program brief for these classes yet. They're still a few years down the way, I believe. The last administration for IB math studies will be, is it 2019? Um, and so we really have to get on the ball with this, but that class really will be actually a two-year course rather than a one-year if they want to take it as such. And so they can continue in that. It won't be as fast a pace as the other SL offering. So I think for students that may have typically taken math studies, this is an amazing place for them to go and stay in IB. Thanks. Any other questions, comments? Um, just a couple of policy um, implications that I want to make sure that the board's aware of with these. Um, and I think both get to um, Mr. Lawrence's uh, and uh, also Ms. Ward's comments. The first is um, with respect to these two IB courses, the global politics and the design technology, I hope one of the things you heard through the conversation, and I'm sure you did, is that we're really trying to make sure that the IB program is accessible for everyone um, and, and that we have offerings for everyone. We, we are into, uh, into a world where we need to make sure that we focus on fairness and equity in the curriculum and the, cr and the process of curriculum. And this offers an opportunity that's significantly different than what's available currently. Um, and then to Mr. Lawrence's uh, point, you know, do we have somebody that, that has the bandwidth to do this work? Um, one of the things, and, and Mr. Hills brought it up at the very beginning, this is a numbers game, right? So there's no, there's no harm in putting this into the catalog as a potential for selection. But if we don't have enough students that are interested in taking it and it isn't selected, we're not going to run it. Um, so from a policy perspective, it's really important that we're all clear right up front that we need 15 students in these classes for them to make, uh, particularly in these tight uh, budget times, because if it isn't, if we don't have enough students, then we won't run it. Um, and so it wouldn't impact other course offerings as well. So I just want to make sure that the board's aware of that as well. And, and also, if I may add, Dr. Noonan, you know, obviously I think the, many of the board members know that at George Mason High School, and because we have 850 students, at times we have to be very creative in terms of the number of course offerings in each section. For example, when you think about some of our world language offerings, um, IB Spanish five, six, we, ha we can have up to three or four uh, offerings in one section because we want to be able to make that course run knowing that uh, the school board policy states a minimum of 15 students in a particular course. And that's something that uh, moving forward we do have to consider. Uh, that's not you know, ideal for some of our teachers in terms of uh, their ability to, for, to have students access the curriculum. And so uh, doing this, I think, does ultimately allow us to streamline that process and really focus on student interest, seeing if that's something that, that is warranted moving forward. And if, if I can respond to that um, just quickly, I, I want to say thanks to Mr. Hills and Ms. Reyes for their uh, creativity when building a master schedule to be able to pull some of these courses together. Um, I, so if, if somebody were to put information out that showed, for example, we're running classes of Spanish 4, 5, and 6 with 12 students, that wouldn't be accurate, would it? It, it would. You actually have to pull from all the different sections. Uh, it might show that, for example, our IB Level 5 class has 6 students coupled with uh, the IB 6, 7, and maybe the AP kids, and that's all being taught uh, under with one teacher in one particular class, and those numbers could reach an upwards of 18 to 20. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion, please. Um, Mr. Chair, I move that the school board approve the following new George Mason High School course offerings. Honors Algebra 2 slash Geometry, Honors Algebra 2 slash Trig, IB Global Politics SL, and IB Design Technology. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, second by Ms. Ward. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you all very much. All right. Next day will be um, discussion of the CFC Comprehensive Plan Review. Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to invite Mr. Padilla up um, this evening to share with you some information about some work that's happening on the general government side with respect to the comprehensive plan and future land use plan amendments that they are looking to make over the course uh, within the next month and a half or so. Um, we are 
uh, as, as a partner with the general government committed to sharing this information with you tonight. Um, and, and there are two ways that we can go tonight. Um, we have put it on here as a, an item for recommendation. Um, and I would, I would suggest recommendation tonight, but if the board were to say, you know what, we'd like to get some more public comment about that, I'd be open to that as well. Uh, however, I think that it's a fairly straightforward um, move by the comprehensive plan, um, in the comprehensive plan to look at how this information is going to be labeled in future maps. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. Padilla. Hello. So, um, if you I think Marty um, emailed, or not emailed, uh, uploaded um, a memo that I put in board docs. Um, it also has uh, a letter to the school board from the city planning department, as well as the actual amendment that the planning commission is planning on voting on um, um, and for public comment in the next few weeks. Um, our, it's, the amendment actually has several things that are unrelated to us. It's got some city um, property that was acquired during the water uh, deal, um, but for us, there's three things, um, and I put them in the memo just so you can have. So it's a in chapter four of the comprehensive plan to add a special revitalization district for education and economic development. Designate on the future land use map approximately 34.62 acres of land located at 7124 Leesburg Pike, partly for parks and open space, uh, used with two school symbols, 24.28 uh, acres, and partly for mixed use, the 10.34 acres and then designate a special revitaliz revitalization district for educational ec and economic development over the entire 34.62 acres of land. Essentially all this is doing is just taking the school section that we've always maintained is gonna become where the new George Mason High School will be um, and the 10 acres of land that's gonna be um, uh, zoned for commercial development. This currently it's still zoned, um, I believe R1 from Fairfax County, the city has never rezoned it um, since uh, they took possession of the land, we, knowing that the, the change would happen. We didn't quite know where the boundaries are gonna be. Um, I met with the city staff the other day and it's pretty straightforward. If you go through the, um, this, pro it's, this is also, I don't know if you can see this very well, but it's in your um, board docs if you wanna look. Uh, there's three parcels of land. Uh, two parcels are currently owned by the city government. One parcel is owned by the schools you can see which, which are designated which. Um, but if you go to the final draft, this is actually the proposal that the Planning Commission will be voting on. The area in green, you see the two, that's their school symbol, uh, shows that that's, that's the part that will be the, the 24.65 acres will be the school site. The number two right here um, is gonna be the commercial development. Uh, that's it's pretty straightforward if, if they don't do the if they don't change the zoning um, the commercial development piece can't start the city can't market the property so um, I'm recommending that this, the school board approve um, the, uh, the zoning change any questions on any questions or? anyone mr. Nkuma I was just going to add a little color to that. Having had the pleasure of sitting in last Friday's economic development meeting, this issue came up and uh, my hand shot up after all the zoning mumbo jumbo that I could not understand. But the only question I had was because there was a debate as to whether to zone the land before the RFP or to zone it after or with the RFP. And all that was important to me was does this, is the, is, was the, was the, were all 34 acres going to be subject to this zoning debate? And, and could we clearly establish that the school portion would be zoned for schools and nothing else? And that was categorically confirmed, which is what I see now. So that makes me happy that portion one, the, I mean, the item, the, the area designated zone one is going to be designated for schools. And I guess between the economic development community and the planning folks, they can duke it out on when and where they do with zoning two, but as long as they give us a school portion, we're happy. So, okay. that's your so sense. I just wanted to follow up on that. So for section two, um, is, that, is that done? Like if we vote on this, that is definitely going to be commercial. Like we can't, not, I, I don't know, I don't think it's been established yet, what we're, what we're doing exactly with that land, how much of it. But if we vote on this, does it restrict us um, if we need to take some land back for school development? 
my my understanding is from when I when I asked the city, I mean, as long as nothing's sold, this the city can rezone anything we want as long as it's our property. So I mean, until we actually the city signs the the sale of the land, they they can still rezone it. Mr. Reidinger. So I just wanted to clarify something. My understanding is that this is just a comprehensive plan change, and it doesn't change any ownership of the land. So since the entire 34 acres is school land, it will remain school land. We still have a say in what happens to it. It's just the comprehensive plan that guides how development would be done. Is that accurate? Correct. correct. This is not changing any ownership. Thank you. Any other questions? Is this something that we need to, to vote on now or just informational? Um, I think you have a choice. I would recommend that you go ahead and, and make a move on it tonight just to put it behind you um, if, you're, if you're comfortable with just this comprehensive uh, plan change. It seems pretty straightforward. It's important for us to have this done um, so that, the, as uh, Mr. Padilla suggested, they can at least start beginning to market the, the mixed-use property and that we can clearly delineate out which is going to be the school property. Uh, I'm okay with that, but Mr. Anger? It's just a question on the form of the motion. The, the motion would be that the school board recommends approval of the comprehensive plan. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Any other questions before I ask and entertain a motion? Right. I will entertain a motion then, please. Mr. Reidinger. Mr. Chairman, I move that the school board recommend approval of the comprehensive plan as presented to the school board this evening. Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Nkuma. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much, Mr. Padilla. Okay. Next is a review of the draft FY19 through 24 CIP. Dr. Noonan. I'm just going to keep on uh, rolling with Mr. Padilla here. Um, we have uh, presented, we, we have prepared for you uh, and, are, and are presenting tonight uh, the 2019-2024 um, Capital Improvement Program. Um, there's some really good news in this Capital Improvement Plan and that is that we have $120 million in a capital plan to build a new high school. Um, we have um, relatively new, uh, new digs at Jesse Thackeray. Uh, we've got the Mount Daniel project going on. And there are just a few uh, capital needs at the other schools, and I'll I'll turn it over to Sevy to, to uh, talk about those. Mr. Pia. Um, thanks, Dr. Newton. Uh, we're trying to keep the obviously the, the the request to the city for the CIP to a minimum during the high school project. So uh, currently, uh, as, as you know, we have the the Mount Daniel expansion uh, going on and has already been funded. Um, the high, I'm he actually let me go down here to my uh, charts, maybe easier to read. Uh, at Thackeray, there, there are currently no CIP obligations or requests that we're going to be making um, for, for this. Mount Daniel is currently um, in the 18 and 19 CIP. Uh, I'm going to go down, I'm going to skip down to the high school. The high school is uh, starting now um, for some of the funding. I've, these numbers were all presented to us from Marcatus through our, uh, our cost uh, cash flow analysis that he did for us. Um, and it's spread out over um, five years. Um, totaling 120 million dollars. These are, these these numbers may not reflect the actual amount that the bonds are taking out that year. That's something still City Council I think is uh, working on, um, as all the the RP and, and the prices actually come in. So that'll be changed as we go go along. But something to keep in mind is you know Mary Ellen is fast approaching 20 years old. So we're going to have to start looking at some of the um, s s systems in that building. The flooring is one of those things that's going to need to be replaced. I have this in here. Our estimation is two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand um, dollars. My my thought was to have this replaced kind of during the high school project. It may be something that we can work with the, whoever wins that project um, on getting a better price um, during that, and it could be funded uh, both through CIP or the operating fund or you know combination of both. Um, the other thing I have on Mary Ellen is replace of the roof. Um, twenty twenty six. It'll be uh, twenty years. So we'll, be, we'll need to start looking at uh, replacing that. And the cost of the roof is going to be $300,000, $350,000 uh, based on today's dollars. <coughs> um, and you'll see the city has asked for a six-year CIP. We, I added three extra years just as a forecast for the city so they'll kind of know what's out there and what's coming. Um, the next large project we have going on is based on the grade realignment of Mount Daniel. 
Uh, the second grade's gonna move over there uh, once the building opens. Um, but after, when we hit about fiscal year 25, um, we're gonna have to start uh, construction or addition on a TJ or maybe some other project if, the, if that's not the, the one we look at, but something's gonna have to be done um, to add the actual, the extra um, student capacity at, at some building. So TJ is what we have right now. Uh, we've, we've already done um, uh, a feasibility study with TJ. Did that about a year or two ago. So we have several different options available, how, how a new tower, classroom tower could, could be put on that property at various places. Most logical one would be probably be where the trailers are currently. Um, price tag on that is, what do I have? It's about 12, no, yeah, about 12 million or so total. Um, it depends on you know what we, what we actually do, but we're looking at that it's fiscal year 25 to 26 with move in around 20, end, end of 26, first of 27. And we'll have to have that done, otherwise Mount Daniel will be above the 660 number that the Fairfax, Fairfax County has imposed on us. Um, so we'll have to do something there. And that's what all I have for that. Thank you very much. Are there any questions about the CIP? Dr. Manning, so when, uh, at what point do we need to approve and, and have this? Um, we need to get it to the general government in January. Um, so we can, uh, again, it, because it's a fairly straightforward CIP, you could approve it tonight. Uh, if you'd like to get some input um, beyond what, has, what we've shared, um, you certainly could let it sit and we can put it up on the website and let people kind of look at it and then uh, approve it in January as well. I just, I don't know um, how much feedback we're gonna get because it's so minimal with respect to, what, to with respect to what's up there, uh, Mr. Ankuma. I mean, as as much as I would love to get this out of the way, Dr. Ankuma, can you tell us when in January, how much time in, in the new year would you have? Uh, we would do it on the January 9th meeting, um, and I think that that meets. I'm trying to remember the night that the CIP is going don't forward the night with the that city. The city has requested it. Um, I want to say it's right in that window. Yeah, it's uh, but if, if it was, I, they may actually be going the 8th. And if they're going the 8th and we approve it the 9th, I could give them a draft um, to incorporate into their um, capital program. Is there a meeting before the 9th? With us? Yeah. Um, no. Okay. Uh, the only reason I, was, I would defer it is so our colleagues coming on board would at least have a chance to own it, if so to speak, but that's about the only reason I, yeah. Any other comments? I'm, I'm fine deferring it to January. Also, you know, just to make sure it is out there for the community to have a look at. I think there'll be questions about TJ, so just letting people know here's, here's what we're planning so they can see that there is a plan for that. It'd be helpful. Mr. Lawrence, did you have a comment? Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Ryan here. My only concern is I, I, I think it is sort of driven by what the requirements are. <laughs> and I, I, I'd also like to hear input from the community if they have any. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned that if the city is going to move forward on the 8th and we're doing it on the 9th, the last thing I, I want is to cause things to slow down the process because I think we have to keep the George Mason construction um, fully in our minds, although this is, this is not a part of that critical path. So um, as long as it's not going to impair um, the city, I'm, I'm happy to wait, but if it's going to cause a problem in the overall budget process, I'd, I'd rather get it done right now. Mr. Lawrence? And just putting on my former planning commission hat, we need to get it done today. I mean, in the past, they've always wanted it in December because it then needs to go to, you know, the city manor, manager and, and city mester because the, the formal presentation of the CIP is at the first planning commission meeting in January. So if, you know, council comes in at 8th and we do something on the 9th, that's putting them behind the eight ball. The, and frankly, you know, we've got enough to deal with them without artificially starting off 2018 with uh, with a problem. I mean, it's just the CIP is a big process, and on top of budgets, the city staff really doesn't need the, the delay. 
with the information from Mr. Lawrence, I'd suggest we approve it tonight. If it, if it brings any comfort to, uh, to the board, um, we are looking at the out years of 25, 26 on the Thomas Jefferson piece, which I think would have the most question. Um, that's still outside of our six year CIP window. So we've got, we've got some time to sort of work through this as well. So if that, if that helps with mitigating a decision about tonight, um, I offer that as a, a possibility. I believe that, that does uh, give that, uh, that little window of comfort there. Okay, um, so with that, uh, I'll entertain a motion for approval of the CIP for FY19 through 2024. Mr. Chairman, I move that the school board approve the submission of the CIP content that was presented to the board this evening. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, next, up will, next up will be the approval of the 2017 legislative package. And I don't know if Dr. Noonan and Ms. Gill kind of on that one go ahead so I actually so nothing in this has changed but I do have a recommendation that we something to add to it if the board would approve it um, so I went to the recess meeting with mr. Swanson at TJ last week and we discussed with the community he discussed with the community how at where it showed people if you if you add more recess in what happens to our schedule and what happens to the students day and what happens to the number of instructional hours um, and it became really clear, I think, to everyone that there's not a great way to add in more time for recess without taking away from other things, including the snow days we've baked in. Um, so my recommendation for us would be, it seems to be that this is the real issue is making recess, um, letting recess count as instructional time, and that's at the state level. And I know that some states have done that and have moved toward that, so that may be something that we want to you know, add to our legislative agenda to lobby for as having, you know, asking the VDOE to count 20 or 30 minutes as instructional time, similar to New Hampshire does it, Wisconsin, and a few other, you know, it's, it's a growing number of states. Um, you know, I don't know how far we get with it, but I think it would help the community. They, they said, okay, this is, really, this is really something that's not in our control. Um, so if the board doesn't agree with that, we could add that to the legislative package. You know, again, again, I, you know, will will it, anything change? I don't know, but it you know, may be worth asking. Sounds reasonable to me, especially seeing as that's if the legislative forum is is where you, where this change or where they will be listen to this and make any possible changes. But that seems, to, and Dr. Yoon can correct me, but I think that seems to be the main issue. Recess does not count as instructional time. So if we add more recess, we have to take that out of instructional time or extend the school day, or as some um, parents have requested, eliminate early release Wednesdays in order to get more time in the schedule. Um, the easiest way to go about this, which may not, is not even easy, is, is trying to figure out can we change this at the state level. Makes sense to me. I have no issue with that. If anyone, we have to. No objection. Do we need to vote on that? I can say so. Do we amend? <laughs> will we amend that uh, to what's already out there for our legislative package? Right. So, so I think the way that we would adopt it would be adopted with, with the amendment made from the guys. And I'm happy to work with Lila. Yeah. I can. <laughs> Okay. okay. And I didn't. I didn't want to talk to Lila before first asking the board if this was something. Um, I didn't want to move without anyone's approval. Question, Mr. Reininger. So, um, I had a question on one other element of the plan. I'm just, and that is, um, one of the continuing issues is that the Falls Church School Board supports legislation to return control of the public school calendar to local school boards. Um, you unpack that for the for me in the community so that that would allow us to decide when we start school it would remove the barrier that we must start after Labor Day as so many other jurisdictions have been able to do via waivers um, that would allow us to decide that you know maybe we want to start a week before Labor Day 
and we would get another week of Christmas vacation back or holiday vacation back winter break. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. So I will entertain a motion and with potential with the addition of Mr. Chairman, I move that the Falls Church City School Board approve the legislative package as presented with the following amendment that the this item be added. The Falls Church School Board supports legislation to allow inclusion of recess time as instructional time. All right, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Gill. Can I ask one yes. question? Ms. Morris? Does it need to be legislation? Can it be done in a, a regulatory or an administrative way? I mean, are, are, are we asking for the hardest way to accomplish this is my real question. Uh, I, I don't know how to, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I do know that um, in speaking with my colleagues from around the state, um, one, this is a very important issue that goes beyond just the city of Falls Church. That it's, it's hitting a number of jurisdictions. Um, Dr. Staples, the outgoing state superintendent, has brought it up with the region, um, the region chairs as well as something that uh, needs to be looked at. And the way that it's been presented to us has been it really is a legislative issue more than it is a regulatory issue. So my, my suspicion is it's, um, the best way to affect or impact this will be through that process. Uh, with that, all those in favor of signify saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you very much. And next we'll uh, approval of the 2018-2019 school year calendar. I'll turn it over to Ms. High in just a second. Um, I, I just want to uh, set this item up a little bit. Um, there has been a little bit of chatter today on the email knowing that it's coming up for your review. Um, and, and I'm going to ask Ms. High to talk about who all was involved in the process um, and also who wasn't involved in the process because I think that that will be important with respect to your decisions tonight. Um, but I also think it's equally important to share with the board and with the community um, that the, the development of the Falls Church City Public Schools calendar is um, perhaps as hard as a Rubik's Cube with your toes. Um, trying to make sure that we get the right number of days in with the right number of hours of instruction and at the same time providing professional development and opportunities for our teachers to learn um, has been uh, nothing short of, of, of difficult. And when you think about the book ending of the year, and it goes to something that uh, Mr. Reitinger um, unpacked just a second ago with Ms. Gill, is that uh, you know we have a uh, we have a rule in the in the state of Virginia, unless you get a waiver, that you have to start school after Labor Day. So we are looking at a post Labor Day start for um, school year 18 on the fourth, and it's my understanding from historical perspectives that it's also the wishes of the board to try to end school by the 14th or 15th of June so that it doesn't prolong into the year. So with those sort of as the bookends um, in the, of the year and with our half day Wednesdays, we, we are fairly locked into when we go to school in order to get to the 990 instructional hours that are required by the state. Um, so what you have here is I think a carefully massaged um, calendar that had a lot of eyes on it um, that builds in professional development days, builds in um, professional time, and also in many ways balances the quarters. I'm trying not to take everything you, from you. You are. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. it's fine. I'll, I'll stop there and turn it over to, to Ms. High. Dr. Noonan has pretty much covered it all, but I can talk a little bit about the, the process. Um, when we developed this camp calendar, we focused on instruction, learning time for students, and professional development. Um, as you know, the Code of Virginia says 180 days or 990 hours. Um, and the 990 hours comes in if, for some reason, we can't make the 180 days due to snow. And so we build hours to then convert to days if that happens. Um, when looking at the calendar draft, we looked at the 180 days for students. 
We also considered the professional days for our teachers, which currently have been 194. Um, we looked at balancing the number of days for each quarter for instructional time. There have been several calendars where the um, second semester was really long, creating a sh really short um, third quarter. And that was difficult for teachers and students because of the IB testing and AB testing that ha AP testing that happens in the spring. Um, we also looked for opportunities to place professional development days um, when they were more beneficial to our teachers and when they could really absorb um, the learning um, time that we're providing for them. And then again, the June, end of June date um, that we talked about last year being the 14th or 15th. And then the last thing that we talked about is um, the potential impact to Mount Daniel staff due to the completion of the construction next school year. And we put two days in um, with there. Um, the initial meeting was the two principals from Mount Daniel, Aaron, Tru Aaron Truesdale, and then Matt Hills from uh, the secondary area, Amy Hall, the HR director, Marty Goodell, and myself. And then once we looked at the calendar and came up with a draft, we then invited um, calendar members to participate on the calendar committee. There was a representative, uh, staff representative from each building or department, and then there was an administrator from each building and department. Um, you know, some of the emails that have gone on today were questions about whether Seek, Peak, and Eek had input to the calendar. And we try to build opportunities for lots of our professional and support staff to have leadership opportunities. So we take the calendar committee as a committee to give some other people an opportunity to have a leadership role. And so we did not take it specifically to Peak, Seek, or Eek. Um, we did ask all of the representatives from the departments or buildings to go back and share it with um, the individuals. And so that's, that was the piece that went on today. Um, we included the, um, like I said, a teacher and administrator. We also included the athletic director, director of transportation, director of daycare, director of facilities, HR, clerk of the board, and myself in that um, a meeting that we had at the end of January, I mean, at the end of November. Um, as I go quickly through the calendar tonight, um, teachers would start on August 23rd, and then students would begin on September 4th. To highlight just a little bit, um, November 5th and 6th, which a lot of times elections happen during then, but that's also our conference time for our elementary um, teachers and middle school teachers. And then we would continue to have the um, Thanksgiving holiday start on Wednesday. Um, we implemented that probably about four years ago, and that's really, um, been well received. Um, a lot of people travel on that Wednesday, so being off um, has been beneficial. Um, for the winter break for next year, it starts on officially on the 24th. December 21st would be a half day, but then we would be out of school from December 24th and return on January 2nd. You will notice that there are two purple days, um, a half day for December 21st and then January 2nd, those days would be, represent for Mount Daniel teachers to be able to be in school, but the students would not attend school. This will give an opportunity for um, the Mount Daniel teachers and support staff to help with, you know, to make the move as we transition as long as everything stays on track with, with the project. Um, in January, the end of the semester would be January 17th. Um, Mr. Hills really like that because if there are any testing or end of um, the semester types of activities, this is a good time. They're just returned from winter break. There's a week for any kind of reviews. Um, we'll, we look at March 15th and April 1st. Um, we've included professional development days there. That's a time when there is nothing else pulling on the teachers as far as having to do conferences, having to do, to do report cards, that would be a time for them to really focus on instruct, on professional development opportunities. Um, and then we would have spring break, the 15th to the 19th of April. Um, and then the graduation would be June 5th. And the last day of school would be a half day on June 14th. Um, feedback that I've received, um, we sent after having the uh, curriculum, the committee, calendar committee go back to their staff. We also sent it out to the calendar to all FCCPS for any employee to look at and send back feedback. Um, I received feedback on two things. Wondering, is there any um, leeway to ending the school year, the second week, June 14th, 15th, um, for future years? Um, there is definitely a preference for a longer winter break, preferably two weeks if possible. 
Um, some teachers brought up the desire to have the calendar match more closely to Fairfax um, because many of the teachers have students who um, go to Fairfax schools, so childcare becomes an issue and is impacting um, them in that way. And then there was also um, concern about the time for teachers to move classroom materials at Mount Daniel um, for next year, wanting a little bit more, more time. Um, but as Dr. Noonan shared, um, the start date, we are where we are. It has to be after Labor Day right now. The end date, um, if we're going to, the board's gonna hold to the June 14th, 15th. And then the other area is early release Wednesday. Um, the one thing I'd like to share is beyond this calendar and the discussion tonight, I think we really need to take a look at you know, um, a study on time, whether it be instructional time, recess time, professional development, just a, a study on what, are, what do our days look like and how are we using them to, to best utilize for instruction for students and also for our teachers. Any questions? Questions? Mr. Lawrence? Not, not so much a question, but I mean, in effect, I was just looking at last year's calendar. This really just slides everything to the left one day. In effect, I mean, mm -hmm. but the biggest change is graduation is now six and a half full school days before the end of the year. And I know we go through this every year, but can you just explain why it's that day and not another day? Um, for our seniors, um, they have completed all of their examinations, SOL tests, um, you know, when we can actually get um, Constitution Hall, Hall also plays a, a component of that. Um, Mr. Hills has, you know, worked with um, the, some of the students, some, they go out and do some internships those last six or seven days for some, some of our senior, seniors, so it's an opportunity for them to have some more community involvement. Um, there are some students who, uh, and the universities start some of their so, summer programs also in the second week in June, so that would give those students an opportunity to be able to participate in um, their, their university college um, orientations that have begun. So that's one of the, those are the reasons. Right, so, I'm, well, I mean, basically, it, it needs to be that date because of the venue. That's when we could get the place where we're gonna hold our graduation, but it's not like they're just then going to school every day and sitting around and doing nothing. No, they typically, a lot of the students do some externships right. um, at the end of the school year. Okay, thank you. Mr. Nkuma? I was just gonna add that because by, they've checked out right after April anyway, the seniors. Anyone else? Mr. Reidinger? So just briefly, um, I'd like to thank the work, the calendar committee and Ms. High and Mr. Noonan for this difficult um, activity. I know it's, it's, you know, no good deed goes unpunished and there's really, you know, there, there's only a couple of ways to square the circle. <laughs> and as both Ms. High and Dr. Noonan pointed out, um, having to start after Labor Day um, and then trying to end at a reasonable time basically forces how long the winter break will be. And you can't, I mean, you can't do anything else. Uh, the one thing I would say is in response to those people who want a longer winter break, I get it, I'd like a longer winter break for our kids too. You know, my kids would be much happier with two weeks off. But I think um, everybody is annoyed, not some people, but everybody is annoyed when school goes to the 23rd or 24th of June. Um, and the actual, it, well, I'll, I'm going to disassociate myself from Mr. Ankuma's comments that <laughs> students check out in April. Um, I, I do think that the, the level of attention from all students after the SOL process goes through and the farther you get into the summer at least decreases in a, in a calculable way. Um, so ending school earlier makes sense and unless and until we have an agreement from the state that we can and then the city decides that we want to start before Labor Day. This strikes me as um, not only the best of all possible options, but really the only possible option. And another component that we do consider is when we do our summer programs, they usually start right after July 4th. Um, at the high school, they actually start the last week in June. So we like to, if school's ending the second week in June, that gives you know, students a little bit of a break before they come back to do some of the summer summer activities that we do, although we, we do more career focused, um, less um, direct instruction, more kind of 
um, project-based during the summer, but still they, students need a little bit of time before they come back to continue to work with us. Any other questions? Uh, just mine is, uh, again, to thank the, uh, the calendar committee for all the hard work that you do every year of kind of putting that jigsaw puzzle together of and trying to accommodate as many different folks as you, you potentially can. Um, one interesting piece of this is that even our students are paying attention to it on during one of the, during our student debate up at uh, George Mason this year, there was a question asked about the early start. So even they are paying attention to and are asking questions about that potential early start. That's, I think they probably paid more attention this year because of Fairfax just starting to do it. Um, but it is something that, um, that's in our legislative package I'm glad to hear and hopefully the state will move towards that and giving us a little bit more flexibility ourselves without having to, to go towards the, the waiver direction and do it. Uh, with that, uh, if there are no other questions, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Go. Chairman, I move that the school board approve the 2018-2019 school calendar as presented. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lawrence. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, on to Approval and adoption of second reading of policies. Ms. Minson. Good evening. We have seven policies for second reading tonight. Um, the first is policy BBBB, student representative to the school board, replacing former bylaw 2.15. There were no changes um, proposed by the board at our meeting in November. Any questions about policy BBBB? Hearing none. Second policy is policy EBA, buildings and grounds inspection. This would replace our policy 4.29. Again, there are no changes um, to this from our meeting in November. Questions? Questions. Next is policy EC, buildings, grounds, management and maintenance. Um, there were no proposed changes between this one and um, the policy as presented in November. I did look in and there were no, there's a question from uh, Mr. Lawrence that um, then Mr. Anderson had asked me this week about whether there were any other um, policies or code provisions um, relating to the application of anything other than pesticides on school grounds. I was not able to find any, so wouldn't recommend adding that at this point to this policy. Questions, anyone? Mr. Lawrence? Okay, so you wouldn't recommend adding even along with any pesticide application, any fertilizer application? Not, not at this point, since that's not explicitly required by the code. That's something that we could look into further if there is a concern. But the Virginia Code does require that the schools document pesticide applications. So I don't know what that would impose on, on SEVI staff and, and on what fertilizers are used at this point. I don't think the board, um, we, we could take it off second reading, look into that, see what is applied, and see if the board has questions about that. But I, I mean, I would pass it as is, but yeah, I would. I think we should look into it because I mean, we should be keeping track of what we're putting on the fields and the you know the turf and every place where the kids are playing. I don't think we need to hold this up now. It can be added in, you know, assuming it's not a huge burden. But I mean, it it gets to the same thing. What what is getting put down and what's safe for the kids? Yeah, we we uh, thank you for that, Mr. Lawrence. We. Uh, appreciate you thinking about it as is, and we certainly will take a look at it and, and get some information and share it back. The next policy is FE, playground equipment. It would have replaced FCCPS policy 4.35. Um, there were no changes proposed um, to this from the last one other than an errant comma that I was grateful for Mr. Anderson pointing out, um, and that was the new version that's been uploaded on Board Docs does take away that comma that had appeared at line 10. Any questions on policy FE? Next is policy FECBB, accommodations for the disabled. This would replace FCCPS policy 4.32. There are no changes um, from what was presented in November. Questions? Penultimate here is policy JEBA, the admittance of children younger than five years old to kindergarten. This was a policy that we had put together that was not based on the VSBA model policies. Um, there was there were two changes in here from the last 
reading to second reading, adding line four that um, the admittance of children who are bona, bona fide residents of Falls Church and adding that it's up to the chief academic officer to make a recommendation to the superintendent. There was a question that Mr. Anderson raised as to whether at line four we would want to add um, when a individual or family needs to be resident to consider admission. I think that's something that could be added at line four now. I also think that if someone were not a resident of Falls Church and came at May 15th to request entrance, we would be able to say you're not a resident, so this doesn't apply to you. Um, but we could certainly add clarification there at line four if that's the inclination of the board. Ms. Lawrence. Just a question. If people are planning on moving into the city, they are allowed to register their kids in school as if they lived here in the intent to move in, right? So shouldn't that also reflect this? I mean, what, th what this says is you, you need to be in here when you make the application as opposed to when your kid would be going to Mount Daniel, you need to be here. I'm gonna defer to Ms. High as far they, as enrollment. They have to show that they potentially will have it by the time that school starts, whether it be a lease or um, a deed or something to a property um, be, to be able to register. Okay, so is that basically the magic that bona fide gives you, where it, it gives you that leeway to say whether they're truly considered residents? Okay. We could also add in, bona fide means that they are residents of Falls Church, but this doesn't expressly say as of what date. So we could add in as of, um, as of the date for they petition for early entrance, or we could say it, with demonstrable evidence that they are um, will be residents of Falls Church as of the first day of the school year. Well, actually, that's a good point. When, sorry, I'll put this down. Um, when could people apply under this? I mean. What I would not want is somebody to be able to come in, you know, having been here and apply on, you know, October 3rd when they knew they should have. I mean, should there be a date that says, if you want to do this, you need to apply by? Yep. Line seven, May 15th. Of the year preceding their early admission. Okay, well then that, so they have to be a resident by May 15th. Without adding any language, that would be the position that I think would be reasonable to take. But if you would want to add in language at line four saying uh, bona fide resident of Falls Church as of May 15th of the year they're applying, I think we could add it in. I, that's, I was just going to say, leave it as is. Let's see you know, how many takers we get and then if future boards need to make an adjustment because... You know, there's a reality of people who are thinking of moving in and, you know, they can't apply because they're not residents by May 15th, then, you know, you make a change then. Did you come to Mr. Stark? No, I was going to say, we start doing this, we start to redefine what a resident of Falls Church is, and you don't want to be passing that. You're either in or you're out. You know, you're either fully pregnant or you're not. You know, that's, that's what's it. Any other questions on JEBA? And last policy of the night is DC. This is post other post-employment benefits funding. As Ms. McLaughlin explained last week, it's something that satisfies the actuaries who do the measurements and allows us um, to, to push things forward. This is not a model policy, but it's one that um, would make sense for us going forward. If the board has any questions on this, there are no changes from this policy from last month. Okay. Any questions? If not, I will entertain a motion, please. Mr. Chair, I recommend that the school board approve second reading and adoption of the following policies. BBBB student representative to the school board, EBA buildings and grounds, EC buildings and grounds management and maintenance, FE playground equipment, FECBB accommodation for the disabled, JEBA admittance of children younger than five years old to kindergarten, DC other post employment benefits funding. Oops. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Gale. All those in favor, signify saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
Thank you very much. All right. Uh, future agenda topics, and I know there are two that are listed on here as a potential um, conversation that we want to have if we want to add those two. The, the first one is we talked a little bit about this evening and was recess, and now one turn over if Ms. Ms. Gill wants to have any. Um, no, so I just wanted to ask if the board would consider having recess as a work session topic. It doesn't need to be the entire topic of a work session, but um, this is a this is an issue that keeps coming up in the community at every grade level. I think it's not just elementary. I'm hearing it from middle school parents as well, um, and just general more movement times. It was Mr. Swanson's presentation. Uh, Mrs. Russell was there too. Um, was really helpful, but it was only seen by a very small number of parents. And there are a lot of parents who said, I really wish I could go, but I still have questions. Why can't I have more recess time? And I think just even explaining to parents how instructional time works, uh, Mr. Swanson had a great Excel spreadsheet where it, you know live changes would show you the impact on days and hours. Um, and then you know discussing as a board how, we, how we'd want to go about um, lobbying to, to change this. Um, Any comments or anyone have a, what's your pleasure of potentially having this as a, uh, a topic that we discuss later? Let's get Dr. Newman's opinion first and then we'll hear from Mr. Lawrence. Thank you. Um, thanks for bringing this up. I, I think it is something that has uh, been percolating. Um, my, my recommendation is if this were to come up as a board work session, that we consider looking at it from more of a research perspective, sort of in the context and vein of what Ms. High was discussing too, which is just time in general. Um, how do we use time in our schools? How do we look at the start date of our schools, the end dates of our schools, the, the, the time on Wednesdays, the professional development days that we have in, and how does that all of that then create a day for kids? And I, I wonder if, um, if we are going to take this up to maybe think about it a little bit more globally through the lens of time. Um, and so maybe, maybe that's a study that we could begin to have um, at a work session by identifying some questions that we might want to begin to get answered um, and then begin to winnow those questions down to figure out what are the three big questions we want to make sure that we respond to over the course of the next six months or so when we actually do a, a study of time. Because I, I, I think it's a worthy exercise. Uh, for this for this board I, I've never seen um, that's hyperbole I don't want to say that um, I, I would say this as, as Mr. Reitinger said I, our calendar is super tight we have some days that are baked in for snow but not a lot and if there's some way to free up some more time that would allow us to do some things differently instructionally with recess with um, all kinds of things I would I would be open to entertaining a conversation about time teacher planning time and the like. Yeah, no, I think that sounds great. I like what you were saying earlier, and so thank you for <coughs> reminding me. Um, I think that's fantastic. And you know, I mean, other there have also been some novel things that came up with Paul, like do we decouple recess? I love that we're a small district, and I think we can be really nimble in this area, maybe even leaders in Virginia, and how we think about recess and activity and how, like you said, how our students and how our staff spend their day. Thank you, Lisa. Ms. Lawrence? Well, I'm just, I just, I like what Aaron said about making movement time because not just recess, you know, there's some schools that have, you know, before school, I'm not sure what they call, but basically ways for, you know, kids who wake up with a ton of energy and they come to school with a ton of energy, they get to burn some of it off before school starts as opposed to waiting till lunch. And let's face it, I mean, people know that exercise is, it's good for the brain too. So I would say don't, don't limit it to recess. But you know, if you're going to expand it to include time in general, include you know before school and, and after school, but make it movement because they, they definitely need more. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I would I'm in favor of it as well. Um, uh, is there a time frame that you would like to potentially, or let you and the staff look at it from a perspective of when it works into our work session calendar? If, if that's acceptable to you, I think. I think we'd like to spend a little time thinking about the timing of it um, so that if we were to make some changes, um, whether it's part of our scheduling process for next, not the scheduling calendar process for next year, how it might impact the legislative package, how it might impact some other things. I think we need to keep those, those goals in mind as well. Um, and, and we've got a little budget thing happening right now that we'd like to 
us to focus on too a little bit. Thank you. Uh, and the other topic was community space allocations. And I know this has come up several times um, about how the community is, has access to use our facilities and buildings and uh, the expression of some folks who find it very difficult of how they have access to, to use our buildings. And um, I would like to, and I think Mr. Ratinger had brought this up as a potential topic, to have that conversation as well. Again, looking at it, um, get your, your feedback on it, and again, finding a time and proper place to have the conversation about this. Um, and again, as you just said, with budget jumping into to full gear here in the next, uh, well, heck, staff's already doing it, uh, but when the presentation happens in, in January. I'll leave that up to you. Mr. Reidinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, as I heard the subject come up a fair amount as the public was talking about the referendum, um, in particular as um, the school system made clear that the community school was intended to be a community school. And there was um, perhaps some cynicism out there that our past practices as a school system was not was not as open towards the community as the community would like in terms of access to our facilities. Um, so it, it seems to me that this is a, you know, a worthy topic, again, to look at. Um, in particular, what do our policies look like? Um, some of the suggestions that have come out are that you know, school facilities be scheduled after, for use after hours actually by Parks and Rec rather than by us. And I don't, my personal view is that's not a good idea. Um, I think schools need to manage school facilities with the exception of things like athletic fields, which I think are already managed by Parks and Rec. Um, but I think it's worthy, it's, it's a topic to discuss to make sure that we as a school system are open to the community and, you know, it's not just the new community school, it's that all our schools are community schools and, and are treated by the residents of the city in that way. So. I think it's something we should spend some time talking about, looking at our policies, how it's done, and make sure we've set the right direction for staff and have the right framework so that um, the community has full, appropriate access. Um, I would agree with that. And if you, uh, before I make any comments, does anyone have an opinion or comments on it? Ms. Lawrence? Well, I, I fully support what Phil said about that. Just one thing to think about, because we have a new high school that we're gonna be building from scratch, so we'll be able to build in better entrance and, and egress and sequestration. I would just keep in the back of your heads, and this is something I talked about with, with Bob Schiller when he was here. Think about if we can have a gym that would be accessible as an emergency shelter. And I'm, I'm mainly thinking what reminded me was, you know, tomorrow's gonna be in single digits, and we have times when you know, there are places where they need to put homeless people at night and, you know, otherwise people are going to die. And there are ways to, to do that in schools and some schools do it. But, you know, you need to make sure that there is sequestration and, and you can do that better with a new school when you think about it ahead of time rather than trying to do it with a 70 year old school. So it's a different kind of community use. It's a, a very different community, but, you know, we can think in a different way than, than we have in the past because we've got an opportunity we've never had before. So Dr. Lane, if you and the staff would uh, look at opportunities to potentially have this, uh, this conversation and, and potential policies or improvement of policies that may need to, for us to talk about and discuss during the work session. All right, thank you. And with that, we are going to the, just a moment. Mr. Reidinger. So, um, on the general topic, I wanted to raise one other possible question for um, future consideration to see if the board wanted to include it in a work session. Um, uh, I think maybe all of us, certainly some of us, um, received a, an email from a community member specifically talking about some of the efforts schools in Arlington are undertaking to address and prevent sexual harassment. Um, and um, I have to say that kind of struck a chord with me. In particular, although it's not school related, what we see is happening you know, globally outside our schools and how as a society we've got to do a much better job 
of ensuring that all that our that students leave our schools um, properly prepared to know how to behave with each other in public life. And it's just as important right now while they're in schools. Um, I, I don't know if it makes sense for us to partner with Arlington on something like that. I'd like to have a deeper understanding. So maybe it's not a work session stop topic to start with. Maybe it's just a, a presentation or a, new, a revised presentation or renewed presentation because we've heard some things in the past about what the schools are doing um, in the space. But I, I would like to have another dive into the issue and if appropriate to have a work session about how we might more effectively um, work with the community and with all the members of our schools um, to make sure that we're preventing sexual harassment. I think that's a great topic area, and I don't know if Dr. Miller has anything. Um, could we start with some information, sort of as you suggested, um, sharing with the, the board what's currently in place, um, and then talk about some possibilities, and then if it does become a work session from there, we certainly can look at it. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple of updates. Um, first, last night, uh, the City Council um, met and uh, voted on a, some, our budget guidance for the coming uh, FY19 budget. And I, uh, in case you all didn't hear, um, they did vote to hold at 2% um, transfer with their budget guidance. Um, with that guidance, we're working uh, on information uh, for next week's budget work session. Um, that we will uh, put together for you to kind of give a sense of where we are, uh, where we think we can go, and what we may be able to accomplish uh, with that 2% transfer. Um, next week at our budget work session, I'm also interested in hearing from you about what uh, your um, priorities are uh, w with a very limited budget um, that we have, uh, what not only what your priorities are, but where some of those trade-offs might be with respect to the budget. I think those will be important to sort of consider as well. Um, Mount Daniel, just a quick update for the board uh, and for the community. The footings are in um, at this point, and so uh, the foundation will be poured uh, from here, and it looks like um, we will have trucks of full of steel coming up the road uh, the first part of January, so the building will start coming out of the ground, and we're very excited about that. Um, Tis the season. There are lots of musical concerts and the like that are going on, um, and many of you have had your own kids and family members and friends' children uh, participating in those. Uh, in fact, there's a chorus concert tonight at George Mason, um, and so I hope that uh, everybody has had a chance to get out to some of those uh, events as well. Uh, and lastly, um, to kind of keep the uh, work of central office alive and at the front of our community, um, uh, one of the things that we started last month was from Central Office, which is a video vignette of myself interviewing two people from uh, Central Office and giving, also giving an update of what's happening. And this month I'm um, pleased to announce that uh, we, we published today, or getting ready to publish today, our newest, um, which will feature not only um, our own uh, Tricia Minson talking about what she does with the law, um, but also Perla and Adana, uh, who is uh, working in our HR and, and uh, I'm sorry, curriculum and instruction department, featuring what she does as well. So uh, we'll pu put that up on the web as soon as it's done. Um, but those are becoming quite fun, actually, to do, and hopefully they're useful. I don't know. But it's just another form of communication to the community about what's happening, and, and hopefully people will pay attention to it. Um, other than that, just want to, again, um, welcome uh, Kristen Michael to the City of Falls Church and for hanging in there with us tonight um, and uh, look forward to the work ahead. I think I've got any questions for the superintendent. I have one. <clears throat> so um, from the, the joint session that we had and this recommended number for guidance that came up, is this for the year or did they move forward with this as being a two year? Well, one, one year, one year guidance for the, for the FY19 budget. And, and I'm asking, as I was not able to, to watch last night, um, was this a unanimous 
oh, by the by the council? No, there were. It was a five-two vote. Um, Mr. Z and uh, Ms. Conley uh, both voted. Uh, were in were in favor of a three percent transfer, and the other five members were in favor of a two percent transfer. All right. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to uh, board and student liaison comments, and we'll start dumped in with Mr. Lawrence. Thank you. Um, last night, Dr. Nooner and I went to the uh, Education Foundation meeting, my last one. Uh, best liaison assignment ever. They, they gave us cake, which was wonderful. Um, they had their books audited and they had a presentation by the accountant and in accountant geek speak they got the best they could they got an unmodified opinion which means and, and our new COO is nodding her head saying that's a good thing um, what that means is they they do a good job of keeping their books and keeping their processes the way they should so you know people who are giving money to them can feel that the money is being handled and spent the right way one shocking figure was 90% of their total expenses are for programs. A good number is 7 to 75%. They're spending 90% on the program. So, you know, I mean, you've, you've seen the, the overhead, and the overhead is a cubicle, which is Debbie, but um, they're really putting their money straight through to the, the kids, the schools, the students, the faculty, and everybody. So that was, that was fantastic. Um, since this is my last meeting, just a, a few comments. Uh, my wife and son were here, first time in over five years, so they you know, never come to these meetings, which is probably a good sign. Um, the one thing I'm not gonna miss about this is getting the, the question from my son about, do you have a meeting tonight, which is you know, way too often, yes, or yes, I have two, or yes, I have one tonight, and I have one this morning, and I have one over the weekend. So I'm gonna get my, uh, my Tuesdays back, my Mondays back, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and weekends, which will be very interesting. It was, I was doing the math the other day. 18 years ago, Sunday, my wife and I moved here, and I added up the time on the library board, the planning commission, and the, uh, the school board, and that also ended up being 18 years, which was kind of funny. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of what we've accomplished here in terms of Mount Daniel, which you know was a nightmare, but it's coming out of the ground. Thackeray, George Mason is on the way. And I'm sorry Justin isn't here because he was the only other one here at the time. I mean, we did what I think is the largest sustained salary increase for our teachers and staff probably in the history of the, the city. And it was something that was done, you know, multi-year on purpose and it was a fight every, every year. And the city council, you know, God love them, they, they stood with us and they spent millions and millions of dollars to get our teachers and our staff, you know, up to where they really should be. So. That was, that was something I was very proud of. Just a couple you know, words of wisdom to the new people. With me, words of wisdom will be few and far between. Um, trust the staff. It, it sounds stupid, but you know, when it comes to policy or curriculum or keeping you from doing something illegal, um, they really are your best friend. I mean, and, and Marty, just do what she says because you're, you're going to eventually. So just the first time she, she asks you to do it, just go ahead and do it. And, and the other thing is, is really gonna sound dumb because you know, you've all got kids and I've known at least one of your kids for years. Um, keep the students in mind because you're gonna get hit with the budget. You're gonna be buried by the budget. You're gonna be buried by numbers. You're gonna be buried by meetings. And it's real easy to forget, you know, the little ones. And that's the only reason, you know, at least two of you are here and not at the, the choir concert tonight. So um, as silly as it sounds, you know, keep the students in the, in the front of your head because there's gonna be a lot that is trying to push it out. So other than that, thank you. It's been a great five years. We're not moving anywhere, We're not going away. Um, Margaret and I are going to show up at every meeting and do public comment <laughs> and then happily go home and have dinner. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lawrence. Ms. Gill. Um, I just want to say goodbye to my 
for now to my colleagues who are leaving. It's been a pleasure getting to know all of you. Um, until next Tuesday. Exactly, until next Tuesday, but in our last official meeting in these beautiful quarters mm -hmm. before they renovate them. For, yeah, anyway, um, so I had uh, the boosters meeting last night um, and two things they wanted me to pass on to you. One, they are strongly opposed to shrinking the size of the auditorium. They feel that it is short-sighted and they think that we should build an auditorium for 1,500 students. I explained the cost implications of that and the structural issues that we run into, having to build a balcony or a mezzanine and um, the expense related to that. They were very pleased to hear that we have an ad alternate for a larger um, auditorium, but they did want to express their very strong objections to the plan to cut it despite the cost-cutting measures that necessitate that change. Um, they also wanted me to remind you that the lights that they bought for the softball and baseball fields are movable and were bought with the intention of being able to be moved and then brought back when the new school opens. So they just wanna make sure that doesn't get lost in translation, it's like $300,000 of lights. Um, Health and Wellness will meet this Thursday. It's very, very active this year. Um, people are really excited. They wanna talk about anxiety, I think, at the next meeting. Um, that's something that our student liaison brought up, that there's a lot of anxiety among students. And so then just hearing from counselors about how students can manage that, who they can talk to at school. Um, recess is something else they wanna talk about. And then we'll hear updates on the walkability grant that they have applied for. Thank you very much. We'll swing down to Ms. Ward. Actually speak tonight. Just uh, in, in retribution for all the late meetings, I plan to speak for a good 30, maybe 45 <laughs> minutes. So hang yeah, tight, right. everyone. Um, now I just wanted to, um, this being the last, um, my last evening on the dais in this capacity, um, I just wanted to mention all of the liaisons, uh, the, the groups I've been liaison to. Um, and one of the first ones was the ESOL committee. Um, and I so enjoyed working with that group and I had seen so many things that they've accomplished through um, Lisa's guidance and uh, the chair's guidance and, um, and the athletic boosters. I so enjoyed uh, working with that group as well. Very dedicated group of parents, some of whom whose children are no longer attending school. They still are members of that that, that group and, and still work very hard to promote the athletics um, at George Mason and Mary Ellen Henderson. Um, and more recently, I have been a uh, liaison to the daycare program, um, um, another, another wonderful, wonderful asset we have in this community. It started in 1974, I think, with 14 children. And it, and it has grown to over, I think there's like 330 kids now in the program. Um, one thing uh, many people don't realize in Falls Church is that the, uh, the daycare committee is its own entity. It is, um, I think it's part of um, community services and it's not part of the schools. People like to think it's part of the schools, but they're their own, own operating entity and they've done a lot of things um, for our schools. They donate, um, um, playground equipment and that kind of thing through their budget. Um, and so it's really been a win-win situation for our schools. We have this before care and after care program and, um, and it's really dynamic program. They, they really listen to the kids and um, design, their, design what, um, what they do, um, their day around what the kids like and what the parents would like for their children to have. Um, and last, I have been most recently on the Gifted and Talented Committee, another great group of parents. I, I'm just loving working with these committees and with the staff that represents um, on the committee as well. Um, so I have some interesting news. I gotta make sure I get this right though, because it's a little out of my purview. Um, the um, TJ Math Olympiad was recent. Uh, recently held, and um, Heidi Lang reported on that at the last um, Gifted and Talented meeting. And I have to say, our, our kids are awesome in the math department. And you can correct me, I think I got this right. So grades four and five scored considerably higher than all the world scores in all the questions, the Math Olympiad questions. But what's even more incredible is grade five scored consistently higher when compared to the world middle school students. 
I, I mean, fifth grade, scoring higher than eighth graders throughout the world. I, I just, I, I just, it, it just goes to show um, the dedicated staff we have, the incredible teachers, and the hardworking students. So I, I, I I'm honored to have been um, part of this uh, community for the last four years, and I will miss it, though I will not miss getting to bed earlier and getting my beauty rest, as I seem to need more and more as I get older. Um, but I want to thank everyone that I have worked with. I, I, too, too many to name. Um, it's just been a wonderful ride. and It's had its moments, but uh, for the most part, I, I wouldn't have traded this experience for, for worlds. I wouldn't have. And to my um, new colleagues stepping in, I'm pleased to see the great talent that we have coming here um, to take over, and, uh, and I wish you all the best of luck, and I know you'll do a great job. Thank you for your, for your dedication and desire to do this. That's it. I really wasn't going to talk for 30 minutes. Got y'all worried. <laughs> Thanks, Ms. Ward. Mr. Thank Inkuma, you. Mr. Nkuma. So, um, unfortunately, my last speak meeting was a conflict with the school board, joint school board city council session. So I couldn't, I missed that. But you heard from Liz Germa. Uh, the, the focus this year has been working on the audit findings. And so, it's in, you know, Ms. Germa and the team are working real hard on that. So that should come out at the end of the year. Band boosters um, haven't made, uh, didn't make the last meeting, but prior to that, the focus was in, I've been getting the notes, uh, looking to go to Chicago this time around to one for a performance. They were, at the, uh, they were at Carnegie Hall. Is it Carnegie Hall in New York? Yes, so that, that was last year. And this year, they're, they're headed to, New, to Chicago. They're going places can tell you that. Uh, the Falls Church uh, Elementary PTA, not much to report there, but they're a dynamic group of folks, uh, a very energized uh, parents and teachers in that, in that group. So it, all I can say is it's in safe hands, it's waiting for their next uh, school board liaison um, person to work with them. Um, and then Dr. Noon and I were at the economic development meeting last Friday. Uh, and I can tell you, it's moving. The, the plans for our school are moving right along because Dr. Noonan is on it, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Jeez, um, what to say? It's all been said here. Um, I had the same themes that uh, Margaret had. Uh, a big thank you to everybody, everybody. Uh, I'll start with the wonderful central office leaders, staff, teach, and the school system generally. Just been just been wonderful working with everybody. Um, for the community for putting their faith in me for four years. Um, um, for fellow school board members, past and present, those I've duked it out with, and those I will be duking it out with later from the dais. Um, especially, I, I want to make particular reference to Kieran Sharp and Susan Carney. They've been, they were very, very instrumental in sort of getting me in here, guiding me along, and keeping me sane around here for a little while, for as long as they were here. Um, and I want to really thank the community for the November 7th vote to move the high school project forward. Um, it's basically validated the four years I haven't been at home. So I'll put that out there. Um, you know, the, it's, it's been great watching all these projects come. I, I look at that capital improvement CIP budget and it's all picture just about every building's been touched or will be touched in the last, in the next few, there's sort of like a four, five year cycle where everything is getting touched and just glad to be part of it. So overall, just like Margaret, it's been a privilege and an experience and I want to thank everybody. Thank you, Mr. Reidinger. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So uh, I'll start with um, one of the things Margaret touched on, which was the, um, what used to be the ESOL committee and is now the LEAP committee. Um, the, uh, it's a very dedicated and energized group of parents who, hearing Dr. Noonan's request for guidance about what's important to them in the budget, had an extra special meeting last night or yesterday specifically just to prepare what that guidance was. Um, and it was, it was a privilege to be a part of that discussion. Um, they worked long and hard about it. Um, I'm sure it will come directly to you, Dr. Noonan, but the, it, 
at the end, they, they bottomed out really on two big priorities because they wanted to do more really important things rather than, sorry, fewer really important things rather than more things that might dilute what they were doing. And the first request um, relates to, you all might remember that we put in a program coordinator in the budget last year and then we didn't get the money from the city council that we needed in order to fulfill that position. So um, they would like that position. They think someone helping to run that program from a central office level um, would be absolutely essential. And the other request really was to um, provide more translation of documents. I know we're moving forward very smartly um, on uh, Spanish translations in particular, but um, the committee members as a general matter thought you know, that it, it, school for people who are not native English speakers can be extremely confusing um, and that whatever we can do to have more documents available in the native languages of some of the larger populations would be really helpful. Um, and both of those struck me as exceedingly reasonable um, as Dr. Noonan's comments from earlier point out with 2% guidance from the city um, we're more likely to be working on try to buy toilet paper rather than hiring new positions. But I think we've got to do whatever we can because um, as um, Mr. Lawrence said so eloquently earlier, the kids come first. Um, on the general point of um, the departing school board members, our colleagues, um, I, there's no way I could be as eloquent as the people who have already spoken. I will just say that um, it has been my distinct honor to have served with people as dedicated as the three of you and as Michael pointed out, the earlier members of the school board, particularly Kieran Sharp, who um, uh, moved out at the time that I came on board but um, served as a mentor to me. Um, we have certainly had our disagreements along the way but you are a passionate, dedicated group of people who always put kids first. And so I thank you. For it. I thank you very much. Uh, and just kind of a brief follow up again, one to say thank you uh, to the three of you for the passion and dedication that you put into this. Uh, it is a, as everyone says all the time about this job, it's a thankless job, but it's one that I think we all have, have a passion for and making sure that the kids in Falls Church are getting the best and the best quality education that they can. And I think over the, the four years and Michael and, and Margaret's case and the five year for John, I think we've, we've seen that progress being made. And the biggest progress we've seen made is to finally get um, passage of a bond to start the, the building of a new high school and the, the many many hours that you all put into that I think um, bears that fruit that we have that project moving forward now finally uh, and I'm gonna leave it with that because I'm getting tired as I'm, I'm taking on Margaret right now I'm getting I'm starting to wind down of being on a plane look being on a plane from starting at about well being up and out at about six o'clock this morning London time to here now, so I'm starting to wind down for the evening, so I'll leave it at that. I know. <laughs> I think you've gotten us set for that, uh, Margaret. I don't think we'll have to worry about that anymore, I hope. All right, with... Uh, all right, with that, there are no minutes to be approved, and everyone can read over the enrollment number. If there's any other information, if not, we stand adjourned for the evening. Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs>